Hello and welcome to the third in this series um, of the Doctoral Consortium Architecture and Philosophy um, series of series, I should say. There have been three of these so far. We started off um, two years ago with Slavoj Žižek um, and have been through a number of, of, um, of, uh, of thinkers since then. Today we'll be dealing with uh, Maurice Molo-Ponti. Um, maybe I should just say a few words uh, briefly um, about what this whole initiative is about. Um, the Digital Futures Initiative itself as a whole is a kind of para-educational um, framework, a platform for disseminating educational ideas. Um, we're trying to use our platform to share ideas across the planet, breaking through all the barriers, the economic, social, and political barriers that otherwise would prevent students and academics from having access to these ideas. Um, and secondly, within that, we have an initiative called the Doctoral Consortium, which is basically trying to rethink the logic of a doctoral seminar rather having than having uh, small classrooms with individual professors with two or three students, but to actually to share a global platform and bring everyone together for that. Um, and so this is part of that initiative. Everything that we do is uploaded onto our Digital Futures uh, YouTube channel uh, seen here um, on the on the bottom there, the, the address on the bottom right there. Um, so Maurice Bolo-Ponti, um, this is, we had to switch the order slightly. Uh, initially, we intended to have this before uh, Andy Clark, who was on last week, and mainly because Andy Clark's own, uh, own work is very much influenced by Merleau-Ponty himself. Um, uh, but this is, uh, Merleau-Ponty is someone I think who's no stranger to architectural theory circles. Um, he certainly was taught uh, where I was taught at the University um, of Cambridge, um, and he belongs to broadly to the phenomenological camp, as it were, um, with a particular interest in the phenomenology of perception. What I find intriguing about the French phenomenologist, as opposed to the German phenomenologist, is that they take a very different view in some senses, very different from their political um, uh, outlook, in terms of their political outlook. Um, Henri Lefebvre and many of them were were out-and-out -out, uh, socialists. They saw this as part of the whole critical agenda that eventually kind of fed it up and fed into the, the May 68 um, uh, watershed moment, shall we say, in French intellectual life. By comparison, the German phenomenologist, phenomenologist um, tended to be a little bit more conservative. And of course, famously, um, Martin Heidegger has been criticized for his associations with the National Socialist Party and because of his, his anti-Semitic writing that appeared in his black books and so on and so on and so on. Quite what that has to do with his philosophy or how, whether we should change our view of his philosophy is another matter. And Rimola Ponti is someone I think who is, who is hugely important um, in terms of our understanding of space, our motility through space. I have also personally used him in my book, uh, um, 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 uh, Ar Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, to talk about how we can understand the way in which AI is a kind of prosthesis to how we operate um, as a form of tool. And the thinking broadly goes from, from uh, the work of Heidegger, who, who sees the tool in somewhat static terms, to the work of Merleau Ponty, who speaks in terms of a kind of proprioception, whereby we absorb tools as part of our body schema. And one thinks, for example, of the way that a, a blind person with a stick will navigate the street, and that stick becomes an extension of his or her um, uh, body schema. And no doubt we'll be hearing about that in much more detail um, from Jonathan. Um, uh, but beyond that, we can also think about how the whole discourse of extended mind that Andy, Andy Clark elaborated with David Chalmers back in the 90s about a simple device such as now the iPhone or something, how that can also become an extension to our mind. Um, we store our phone numbers there. We don't need to memorize them anymore and so on. It becomes an extension of ourselves. Our cell phones become our cell phones. Um, and and beyond that, uh, um, Andy Clark then went and wrote an essay, wrote a book, um, Natural Born Cyborgs, which is a very beautiful book, very clearly uh, explained, where he talks about we are all already cyborgs. We all have extensions of ourselves in terms of our applications and so on. And I think from that point of view, as we move into AI and see AI less as something that is out there that is separate for us and more as a form of, of uh, extended intelligence or intelligence augmentation. There are several terms that have been used for it. So Merleau-Ponty fits very neatly into that trajectory, trying to understand how a tool can become an extension of the self, a prosthesis and so on.
Today, we're delighted to have um, Jonathan Hale with us. Um, Jonathan is actually an old friend of mine. Years ago, we used to work in the same architectural office, and I can recall dragging him to the University of Nottingham so successfully that he's still here, still there. I think you should get a, some kind of medal for uh, staying in the University of Nottingham for so long. Um, and Jonathan, of course, uh, has uh, famously been very active in, in terms of publications, but especially from in the context of today's session, he is the author of Merleau-Ponty for Architects. So, Jonathan, it's fabulous to have you here. Um, welcome. Um, and uh, uh, over to you. Great to see you. Thank you. Thanks. You're muted, Jonathan. Unmute. Yeah, sorry about that, Neil. I was getting a strange audio. Um, yeah, am I still still muted? No, you you'll be getting now. Yeah. Begin. yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the time lag there. Yeah, I was getting two audio channels uh, from your end coming through oh. with a for some reason I don't know. Maybe nobody else is getting this. I mean, while while I'm speaking. Okay. Well. Um... Okay, well, let's 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 hope not. Okay, is it possible? Oh, I, we 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 can hear you fine. I can hear you fine. Yeah, what what I'm getting now is I'm getting some feedback. I'm I'm you, getting myself playing back uh, with a time delay, which is curious. Do you have any device on at the moment which is which which you're watching yourself, as it were? Yeah, I'm just trying to work out if um, it's coming through headphones. I wonder why. Yeah. Try taking your headphones off. And try muting yourself. Hmm. Oh, no, 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 not, no, mute, no, don't do that. Sorry. Um, yeah. If I take, uh, if I can take the headphones out, you, you, you can still hear me, can't you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That, that's it's curious fine. yeah i'm sorry sorry about that but uh, that only turned up i think as you as you started speaking uh okay. and then i was getting maybe when the recording started anyway okay. i was getting a, a time delayed uh double uh, channel effect okay but um anyway yeah hopefully you can uh you you can still you can hear me yes okay. yes right. yes yep Right, so that that's my uh, <clears throat> that's my title, uh, which I wanted to. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to try and turn my uh, uh, volume down if I uh, if I can do this. Sorry, just which might help me, uh, so I can hear you. Uh, yeah, hang on a second. Okay, I've called this um, uh, Melo Ponti and the and the technological subject, and uh, it's I suppose the, the the main reason for this is uh, partly I've adapted this from a, from another uh, presentation, uh, but I also thought it would work well as an introduction, just in broad terms. But it would also I think help relate what I'm saying today to um, to what we heard from uh, from Andy Clark uh, early, earlier in the week. Um, so I'm also going to try and situate some of this against a kind of a much longer backdrop. So beyond just uh, the sort of broad sweep of Meloponti's uh, career, if you like, to see it against also against a, a much broader uh, kind of historical backdrop, um, uh, effectively an evolutionary uh, timescale as well. So there's a kind of in, embedded within the presentation on Meloponti, there is a, a kind of a polemical uh, uh, kind of statement as well, I suppose um about uh what i think of as anyway at least one of the key kind of broader implications of uh Melo ponty's work and in relation to uh, more recent thinkers such as andy and others uh working particularly in this area uh, around technology and uh, embodiment um artificial intelligence as you hinted at in your uh, introduction and um 
which I think, again, as you say, is has inspired, if you like, a, a new generation of, of interest in um, uh, in, in Merleau-Ponty's work. So I think this relationship between technology and the body or between the body and technology, I think that's kind of central. Not that Merleau-Ponty sort of thematizes technology very, very specifically in, in his work, Not, nothing like in the way that Heidegger goes on to do in his later work. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I mean, my way into Merleau-Ponty, I suppose, comes through an interest in, in technology and particularly around uh, materiality and tectonics in architecture. So just to say as background, that's that was my kind of first encounter with, with Merleau-Ponty, helping what I thought was just to, to, to kind of wrestle with some of those some of those uh, deeper deeper issues. Um, this is a quote, again, this may seem a little bit um, uh, slightly unusual in, in the context of Merleau-Ponty's work, but I just think it's an example and a really interesting, you know, historical example of, of an interesting line of thinking around this sort of reciprocal relationship between the body and the kind of tools that we use um, even in an everyday sense. And I think one of the best ways in to Merleau-Ponty um, uh, actually, you mentioned it again in your introduction, the uh, example of a, a blind person uh, with a, a navigating with a with a stick, um, which really just, I suppose, highlights a kind of key moment, if you like, in um, in in uh, Merleau-Ponty's uh, philosophy. But um, what it does, what it does, I think, is just give us a really clear example of a way of thinking about what's going on at the kind of or what we often think of as a kind of interface between the body and the tool. And, and this suggestion that um, I think you also use the term uh, prosthesis, the idea of the technology, the tool as a, a kind of a technical um, uh, prosthesis, if you like, a, a, an extension of the, the physical body. Um, the danger, though, is just that it, 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 it sort of, I suppose, um, tends to be the, interpreted in, as though that's a kind of a linear uh, that only works in one direction, if you like, in a linear sense. So we go from the, the body through the tool out uh, in, into, the, uh, in, into the world. What the quote from Engels, I think, really usefully reminds us of is that there is a kind of circular, or there should be anyway, a better way to think about what's going on at that interface between the body and the tool is to think of it not in a linear sense, simply an extension of the body outwards into the world, but as 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 the kind of as the center of something, you know, where something begins, and what's going on there is a circular process. So I'm going to try and unpack uh, that idea a little bit further. But I just wanted to flag this up because I think it's a really interesting kind of historical precursor, if you like, to uh, to particularly what uh, Merleau-Ponty is doing uh, in his uh, philosophy. So this is the example, of course, um, uh, simple example. I think this is one of the still the kind of classic examples that um, help to illustrate the, the sort of, in a way, problematic nature of the body or, or the, the idea of thinking of the body as a bounded and fixed entity, that it's, you know, that's the kind of classical humanist kind of, uh, if you like, understanding of the body, that everything begins there in a sense, the center, the seat of the, of the, the, of the subject, of, of subjectivity. Um, as though that is a given, as though that's our kind of starting point. Uh, this is an example of Merleau-Ponty illustrating the idea that <laughs> that the, it's very difficult to say where the body ends and the world begins. And so we can sort of just say that in a general sense. But this is, I think, a really, really clear um, practical illustration of what he's talking about there. You know, what actually goes on at the moment or the, at, the, at the point of contact, if you like, between, in this case, the hand and the cane, and then the cane, and whatever the, the surface is that um, the cane is uh, in contact with. And the reason why Merleau-Ponty thinks this illustrates uh, a sort of a blurring of this so-called boundary between the body and the world is just the way in which the tool is able to be um, incorporated, which is a really key term, obviously. In other words, made part of the body um, momentarily, at least. I mean, we can pick tools up and put them down again, obviously. Um, they rarely become sort of permanent uh, elements of the body. Um, but the key point is the process by which we we learn to use a tool like this. And this was one of Merleau-Ponty's uh, descriptions. Um, he uses the term habit, or at least it's translated, um, it's fairly close translation from the French, but the word habit unfortunately loses some of its specialness, I think, in English, because it's such a kind of everyday 
term we think of habits often as negative things you know we accumulate bad habits and we're constantly trying to change them but um, what he's talking about here relates to a term I think Neil you uh, also used in the introduction uh, the the notion of a body schema um, which is really not an image of the body that's another translation issue in this early uh, in the original English translation 1962 of this book uh, Phenomenology of Perception um, body schema is translated as uh, as body image, which again is problematic because it, it emphasizes overemphasizes the visual, suggests that what we when we have a, our sense of embodiment is 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 somehow grounded on a visual image, you know, and that, and that that's it, and that's really not at all what Meloponti is intending here. So the new translation, the the 2012 translation, uh, tries to correct that at least uh, as it does with other terms, and I absolutely recommend this uh, this revised translation uh, over and above the 1962 version for various reasons. We could perhaps talk about that later. Um, the key point here is just what habit involves for Meloponti, and it's a gradual kind of accumulation of, of bodily routines, really. These are sort of bodily operations, their bodily skills, their abilities. Uh, I suppose, yeah, their abilities to take up pieces of the world for the moment in the shape of a tool such as a blind person would with a stick and use it as if it were part of the body you know use it skillfully once with, with practice of course as it becomes habituated um much as we learned to drive a car you know to perform a whole number of bodily operations more or less simultaneously without having to focus on them, without having to uh, think about them. And if we do try and think, if we try and stop to think about what we're doing in the moment, that's when things normally go wrong. So um, that all takes time to acquire that ability, that skill, you know, the ability to, to, to do those uh, operations. Uh, like walking and chewing gum, it's a famous, uh, another famous example. Um, the ability to do those things they become sedimented into a uh, bodily routine. And then those routines, if you like, become our first means of dealing with or starting to cope with, as uh, Hubert Dreyfus would say, another in, uh, kind of recent close interpreter of, of Meloponti and, and Heidegger, um, that idea of the ability to cope with the situation that we're presented with um, is is grounded in this, this kind of initial encounter with the world through the body. And that that's a bodily sense of how to, to deal with the situation much more than it is uh, an intellectual sense a grasp or a kind of um, set of, of uh, intellectual propositions so there's some some key ideas tied up in in this one I put this in again partly just because this makes the point I think more dramatically than Meloponti's example of a blind person with a stick we talked about tools being picked up and being able to be put down again at uh, you know very quickly. Um, this was an example, Stellark's famous uh, third hand project um, of a slightly more permanent, if you like, uh, incorporation. Um, and and the process is again involved in learning how to use it. It's it's not just echoing uh, the actions of his two biological hands, if you like. It's actually controlled from uh, connections to his uh, the top of his leg around the hip area and um it, it obviously took some time to learn how to control it so initially they're just just randomly moving and it gradually kind of gets this thing under control and uh, whether he ever was literally able to write uh with three hands at the same time uh, i did try asking him this once and uh he seemed strangely un uh, um unwilling to give me a straight answer as to whether th this photograph on the left was actually uh was uh, is is true in the sense of him performing these three actions, separate actions simultaneously. But anyway, um, now this is uh, Andy Clark. I said to Neil, I, I'm very happy to follow Andy Clark uh, lecture, even though it's a difficult uh, challenge. But um, uh, I already have this uh, this quotation from um, Andy's famous essay on, on the extended mind, Andy Clark and Dave, David Chalmers. Uh, on the extended mind. So we, we just got, I use it here just because it's illustrating this idea that we're not just talking about a kind of straightforward physical capacity, if you like, we extend ourselves through a tool, uh, whether it's Heidegger with the hammer or as someone, uh, a carpenter using a saw and so on. Those things you could imagine straightforward kind of physical extensions of a, of a, a human you know capacity that we have anyway we can break wood with our hands but not so precisely and uh, uh, in not such large pieces um and he obviously takes this into the realm of a kind of cognitive process or a series of cognitive supports or uh, i think what he calls scaffolding in some places 
that um, that uh, help us to think. And as architects, designers, of course, we're probably very familiar with this just from the way that we use drawing and, and as well as making notes. But thinking through drawing, I think, is a really much better example in a sense, rather than just the note, writing down of a note about something feels like it's just recording. It's more about memory, I suppose, an externalized memory. Whereas the way we use drawing in design has obviously a much more exploratory um, function in terms of allowing us to, to develop something, something that we can't fully conceive beforehand. And that is really important, becomes, will become, hopefully uh, we'll get to it later, in terms of uh, Melo ponties analysis of language, the way language works, which again, the key thing there is his insight that um, language is not just a kind of representation of a thought that already exists fully formed in the mind, that it's that language itself is the tool by which we, we are able to think and, and by which even speaking to ourselves, if you like, we're able to realize, if you like, a, a thought uh, through through language rather than just, um, just represent it. So um, the quotation, I guess uh, I did have another quote. I took it out, actually. I had a quote from Tim Ingold, uh, anthropologist, which is actually the kind of the view I'm trying to get away from in the sense that he describes a tool or defines a tool as, a, as a, the, uh, something that extends the capacity of an agent to operate within a given environment. And the reason I don't like that one so much is, again, it has this linear emphasis. It assumes we know what an agent is. The human agent is already kind of a given. We start there and we pick up the tool and we extend our capacity to do things uh, through it. Now, I think I hinted at this idea of some kind of circular relationship that's much more complex what's going on, the relationship between the body and the tools that it uses. And I think this quotation from the French philosopher Bernard Stiegler uh, really gets at, I think, the crux of the issue here. So, yeah, I would say this is, I think, a much more productive way to think about that notion of prosthetic. It's not a mere extension of the body. There's something there which is at the heart at the sort of the core of the very constitution of a body as a human body is um, is that uh, in the sense we are yeah co constituted constituted by our tools by our technologies and that's a quote and and Stiegler is using it if you like as part of it, again a kind of disc talking within a kind of evolutionary time frame to think about the way the human species has evolved in its later stages of evolution has evolved in an environment in which tools are, you know, tools exist or are beginning to exist. So it's not just human beings evolving in a natural setting. Um, it's becoming gradually also a technical or technological setting. And that in itself is acting as a selective uh, evolutionary pressure, if you like. So our adaptations are then kind of, we're adapting to the technologies that are already, we already find around us. So anyway, all of this, in a sense, is a sort of preamble to um, Merleau-Ponty proper. But I just put that in. If somebody had to go and that's all they could hear of the talk, you'd have got in a very short capsule form one of the absolutely key ideas in Merleau-Ponty's work and the way it can be opened up, I think, usefully to, to some uh, much sort of bigger, bigger questions. Um, so that's the yeah mind body world that tends to be uh, or that uh, definition the, the the tool as a prosthetic tends to involve just drawing a line there going from left to or drawing arrows going from left to right we start with the mind in the sort of Cartesian sense if we say that's the ground of human being thinking I think therefore I am or I am thinking therefore I exist um, that's a problem and it's a problem of course that phenomenology as a philosophy tries to take up again, initially in the in the work of uh, Edmund Husserl, uh, at 1900, conveniently, 1900, 1901. That's, uh, in a sense, a starting point, um, trying to have another go at dealing with that problem that so we inherit. Uh, we could trace right back to Plato and Aristotle, but certainly formalized and, and then labeled, if you like, the problem of so-called Cartesian dualism, the separation of mind and body, but that notion that our, our grounding, you know, we begin philosophizing by by thinking of, of the mind as a thinking substance, you know, a kind of mental substance distinct from any physical substance. And, and then we, we're desperately sort of trying to then push out in, into the world. So that is what I think phenomenology really contributes to 20th century discourse is, is some really interesting ways to rethink, to kind of have another go at dealing with that problem. Uh, but of course, Melo Ponty realizes that um, we, we're, the problem is that we we shouldn't be starting on the left. 
Um, now he does that himself. So I'm, I'm now kind of setting up a bit of a framework through which to see the development of Melo Ponti's own um, career, if you like, a series of publications. Uh, I'll map that. I've got a slide coming up in a, in a second to, to map that. Um, but that's where I'm, I'm heading with this, if you like. Um, so we're going to end up, uh, hopefully at the end, uh, if, this time, if I get to the end of the, the slides, we'll end up in the middle of this diagram, basically, saying that's really where we need to begin. Body or embodiment is the beginning of everything. And if we want to make some sort of distinction between subjects and objects, i.e. the mind and the world, then, OK, we, we could do that. But it would be a kind of a secondary operation. That would be an abstraction from a starting point, which is much more messy and confusing, confusing literally, um, some kind of soup of embodiment and perception uh, and so on, out of which we might construct a kind of uh, in intellectual abstraction that okay. divides the world up between subjects and objects. But uh, that we shouldn't start with that, that the problem, I suppose, that phenomenology tries to deal with is that, the, yeah, that's the wrong place to, to begin. I'm going to come come back to that because that, and we, we we see that again in in Melo Ponti's um, early work. Uh, but this is, uh, I think, an interesting. This is not his uh, first publication, so I'm pushing on a little bit. But I just think this is a useful summary. I think this is taken from a, a piece of writing that he produced as a sort of prospectus of his work when he was applying for the chair of philosophy at the Collège de France in um, in Paris. And um, and this is what which I think is interesting that he's taking a step back and reflecting on on what he's achieved so far, if you like, in, in his early, early work. Um, but I hope it, it emphasizes this key point effectively that I've uh, also sort of begun with, in a sense, the idea that the, that the mind sort of begins with the body, reestablish the roots of the mind in its body and in its world. Um, and of course, He's created one of the great philosophical traditions he's he's critiquing is uh, uh, empiricism, the idea that perception, uh, human perception is simply a response to a set of incoming stimulations. We you know we gather as if we could be sort of gathering sensory data, filtering it, sorting it out, trying to make sense of it, uh, and then acting. And of course, Andy uh, Clark last uh, last week uh, talked very nicely about this this problem and and the predictive Andy's model, the predictive processing model, is a very nice way again of sort of circularizing this this process to say, yeah, we're not just passive observers sort of waiting to be stimulated by the world. We're acting, and out of that action, we're producing perceptions. And and again, through a you know a, an ongoing kind of circular uh, process. So the insertion of mind in corporeality. That's key, uh, as is the ambiguity, the ambiguous relationship which we entertain with our bodies and with perceived things. So Meloponte is trying to, to, to say, yes, there is a fundamental mystery there, if you like, at the heart of, of being, you know, we could say. Um, and we'll we'll never get to the bottom of it. It's uh, it's it's uh, yeah, it's not because it's not a sort of a clear it'll never be a clear process, you know, and it's it's because it's not in an intellectual sense, you know, this. We begin with a with, with a with an embodied experience. Um, the the attempt to make sense of that in, in intellectually is always going to be a kind of a secondary operation. So we shouldn't expect sort of absolute clarity about what's going on at this at this sort of uh, starting point that I've called it um, in this realm of, of embodiment. Okay, so uh, that's sort of Act One, if you like, or introduction. Um, I'm just going to have a little interlude here, a couple of slides, uh, basic, uh, uh, yeah, biographical kind of information. That's uh, that's Melo Ponti, uh, I guess, in his uh, study. Um, he was quite well known for not looking particularly like an academic, I suppose, but looking a bit more like a businessman or a banker. You know, he's he doesn't look like the sort of radical political activist that uh, you might expect in uh, of a Parisian uh, intellectual. Um, even though he was that uh, as well, and was of course great friends with uh, Jean Paul Sartre, they founded a, a literary and political magazine together. Fell out massively, as French intellectuals uh, often do, um, but fell out both as members of the French Communist Party, quite active members, uh, very much politically engaged. You know, it's one of the things that always puzzles me when people say, "Oh, phenomenology, it's so far away from politics." You know, it's so cut off from everyday reality, society, so. Do and I keep saying, well, hang on a minute. Uh, the, Melo Ponti was uh, absolutely active, was writing political um, 
pieces of work, which of course are very topical now. Nobody reads them now because they're about what political events are happening right at the time. So they're often just kind of separated, seen as a call, as if somebody else was writing them. But anyway, we're, again, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll something we'll, we'll pick up at the end. Uh, apologies for the amount of text on these slides. It's partly just to sort of show that they're, they're on the screen, if you like. Um, they won't be here for long. Um, if anybody's looking at the recording, they can pause it if they wanted to pick up any of this sort of detail. Um, I won't go through it all. It's just there as a sort of boilerplate uh, biography, I suppose, just to say... Um, yeah, I think one of the things I've mentioned the magazine already, uh, and Sartre likewise, um, he was also, or they were also in the same year uh, at uh, the Ecole Normale as uh, Simone de Beauvoir, which is a terrifying prospect as, a, as an academic, you know, a lecturer, imagining you might have three students, you know, sitting in the back of your lecture uh the, the you know with this sort of about, about to kind of burst onto the scene as these kind of three sort of world figures uh slight scary prospect i don't think i've ever had three students like that in any of my lectures but i'm still hopeful it uh it might uh it might happen um now a couple of things that are maybe just worth picking up there's sort of to what you'd expect I, I suppose in terms of dates and career paths you know professor of philosophy is a, the one that stands out uh, is this one here 1949-52 professor of child psychology and pedagogy at the Sorbonne um and I've heard it you know one of sometimes referred to as a, you know a period where Merleau-Ponty was dabbling in child psychology something like that well he was doing a lot more than just dabbling let's say um, you know, he was seriously engaged in a number of areas that are really, you would think, on the fringes of philosophy proper. Um, one of them, and that stays through his work, actually, all through his career, is an interest in psychology, particularly experimental psychology. Uh, Gestalt psychology was very much almost like a previous generation, I suppose, by the time Merleau-Ponty is writing. But he's drawing on a lot of scientific work, a lot of scientific evidence, you know, much in the way that um, we're fairly used to today. You know, a lot of popular science, popular philosophy trades quite freely between uh, uh, philosophy and, and psychology. Uh, Merleau-Ponty was, yeah, very much uh, uh, doing that, but really focusing, child psychology is interesting because he was really, really concerned with development, uh, both into, uh, more so of the individual. So let's say ontogenetic development rather than these, this evolutionary, the phylogenetic development that I'm also interested in. Um, but I'm, I'm, yeah, there are some parallels there, which I think are really interesting. I guess the tragedy and the sad ending in this part of the story is just that Meloponti died so young. Um, he was just 53 uh, when he had a heart attack, uh, uh, died suddenly. So at the height of his career, really, and with a, with what many think of as his major, his major work, um, uh, still unfinished, but thankfully finished enough that it was able to be published and then translated and then published in English as uh, as a book. Effectively, it does hang together quite well as a book, the visible and the in and the invisible. So it will uh, it sort of come around. We're going to talk. We, I'll take the work more or less in a in a kind of chronological sequence. Um, this was again as me quoting my uh, the uh, book, my introduction to Meloponti for architects. And um, just to, again, put in a little bit of background, I mentioned uh, areas that he was interested in um, on the previous slide, uh, pr somewhat peripheral to philosophy. The other was uh, anthropology. And he was very good friends with uh, Claude Levi-Strauss, um, structural anthropologist, let's say, if we want to make uh, put a label on it. Uh, and that, again, for some people is, a, is, a, is somewhat of a surprise in a sense that, um, you know, apparently classical sort of phenomenological thinker could also be so influenced by structuralist philosophy. And 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 he was reading uh, Saussure, I have another quote in a second, but uh, reading Saussure, but was very good friends with Levi-Strauss. And there's a very strong impact on Merleau-Ponty's work in the middle part of his uh, his career. So I'm going to I'm going to try and flag some of those up in, in a second. Um, so this is how I just, uh, decided to, to do it. I don't quite follow this order in my book, but uh, I have just flagged up for what it's worth. I've put in uh, some chapter numbers. If anybody, again, wanted to follow any of this up in, in the book, uh, uh, oh, that's an abbreviation. Sorry, that's a bit confusing, a bit of code there, MP4A. That's Meloponti for Architects. Um, so I've got a few references to that if if, you're, if that come, crops up again. Um, but I start here uh, with uh, Meloponti's sort of um, 
two major works, really. And for and for many people, um, the second of these, Phenomenology of Perception, published in, in French 1945, which was his sort of major thesis, major PhD thesis, if you like. Structured behavior was the first part of it, was a minor thesis, so-called. Uh, and Phenomenology of Perception, the, um, uh, the major thesis. And it's strangely or interestingly symmetrical with uh, with Heidegger's work in the sense that being in time, for most people, again, the sort of key major text that Heidegger produced, that again was his PhD, effectively his PhD uh, thesis. Um, now, what I start with here, I think the, I hope the labels are useful. I mean, I'm slightly simplifying, obviously, for the sake of giving a kind of a structure and an overview of what I think of as a development, a series of three clear steps in, in Merleau-Ponty's uh, career. But um, beginning with this one, the uh, the so-called body subject. Um, and I've talked about the body. I had the body in the middle of my kind of diagram of circular causality. Um, but uh, And I said, well, we're going to sort of end there, if you like. We're going to sort of find ourselves there, hopefully, when we get to, to the third part of this uh, structure. But um, in a sense, Merleau-Ponty also begins there, begins trying to map out a sense of, of the body subject uh, right, right from the beginning. Um, now, one of the problems there, uh, I think actually, well, uh, I'm going to go, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to this diagram in a second, because this comes up again in, in a minute. I just want to make sure I get the, the, uh, these elements in, in the right order. Um, this is really where... Um, uh, Merleau-Ponty, uh, in a sense, begins. I mean, I've touched on it already with the idea of the body schema. In this case, it's, he's, he's wording it slightly differently, calling it a corporeal or a postural schema. So part of that is is often called proprioception, the sense, the inward sense we have of where of where our body is or how we're configured. You know, where is my arm at a certain point? Am I pointing over here? Or am I leaning backwards? Affects my balance, so my inner ear is playing into this. Um, but the whole network of nerves through the body, the muscles, tendons, and so on, sending information constantly back and forth, uh, process through 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 the uh, through the brain, um, that's giving us an ongoing kind of sense of where we are in space and how we're moving and what we need to do in order to move to the next position that we'd like to occupy or to reach out and pick up a, a, a glass of water and uh, and so on. And what Merleau-Ponty wants to do with this idea of um, the sort of sense of our body, where it is, and then what it can do, what it's able to do next in a, you know, in a given space or a given env environment, is he thinks of the body schema and this idea of a bodily grasp of, of the environment as a system of possible movements, or what he says, what he describes here as motor projects radiating from us into the environment. But again, you can see this uh, slightly problematic language there, because again, it feels as though well, we, be we begin with the body and then we're sort of reaching out. Um, but what he goes on to develop is the idea in which um, th this, is, this is assuming a certain level of familiarity with an environment. And it may be literally our own workspace, where again, like driving a car, we can probably reach out and grab the things that we need without having to look for them. We just know they are where we put them when last time we used them. And uh, we have a very, pretty well worked out, if you like, mental map, you might say, of, of particularly our own personal space, our own personal workspace uh, and, and uh, our living spaces, such that we can do a lot of these things on autopilot, you know, without having to consciously fixate on things. Um, so we have a kind of bodily, it's almost like a kind of flywheel in a way, a kind of corporeal sort of flywheel that gives us a sort of ongoing grasp, again, that ability to cope with the environment, um, particularly when it's when it's familiar. So there is something in that, I think, which is really, really key. And again, I think what's interesting here is just this terminology at the end, that our body is not in space as an object, simply as an object, another object in the world but it inhabits space. But again, that sounds a bit too everyday. Of course we inhabit space, but he adds then that the body haunts space, which I think is really curious. I don't, I can't say that I know exactly what he's trying to say. It's a curious choice of terms, but you can feel, I think already, and this becomes much clearer in his later work, that he's really pushing against the boundaries of what's what the language is able to say. You know, the language that we're sort of given, you know, the language that we inherit, that's been invented by others. He's really, really pushing at the limits of, of what's what's possible 
to be described in in linguistic terms. So I think that's uh, that's interesting. But again, I'll I'll leave that. Maybe we come back to that in the um, uh, in the discussion. Now, this is where I think the problems arise with Merleau-Ponty's initial position. Uh, as laid out in those first two books, Structure of Behaviour and Phenomenology of, uh, of Perception. And this is brought up, again, I mentioned this idea, that piece of text or that earlier quote, uh, he was writing that as a reflection on his work when he's applying for the uh, the chair at the Collège de France. This is a, a piece of the transcript from one of his um, uh, interviewers, effectively, one of his sort of interlocutors, you know, that he that's then questioning what he's presented to them as his case, you know, to be employed as a, as professor of philosophy. And this, I think, is a really important, really insightful contribution to this discussion um, uh, by, uh, of course, we forget, I, I have no idea who uh, Monsieur Beaufray is, but he was on the interview panel and he had a massively important insight into the key problem of uh, Merleau-Ponty's early work, particularly the phenomenology of perception which is that he is still, broadly speaking, somewhat stuck in this sort of binary model of the body on one side and the world on the other. As though there is this kind of it's in separation. You know, first we have a body or we have an agent, to go back to Ingold's term, and then we have this problem of thinking, how on earth can we engage with the world? You know, how can we reach out to that sort of shell that we seem to be contained in um, and, and, and have some experience of the world that we can rely on, you know, that purports to tell us of things that are actually happening out there in the world. So he's still in a way stuck in that problem, that binary model of beginning with the body or beginning with the individual, and beginning with a subject, what seems to be still a kind of traditional notion of the human subject, and then addressing the problem of how we become conscious of things out there in the world. So the term is subjectivity, the, the idea that perhaps he needs to abandon the, the notion of subjectivity is really the key point here, I think, the crux of the problem. Um, there is a footnote here, maybe this is a slight digression, but one of the reasons he, he has that problem, Meloponti, in his early work, is of course that he's working in the tradition of phenomenology, broadly as set out by Edmund Husserl. Now, the, one of the key um, innovations, if you like, in Husserl's um, for whole philosophy is is what's known as the um, the notion of intentionality or the intentionality of consciousness, which is a strange term. It's not really anything to do with having an intention to do something. Um, what it means is the it, it relates. It tries to explain the relationship we there is between consciousness and the world by talking about consciousness as being um, necessarily um, consciousness of something. That there is no such thing as an empty state of consciousness. If you like, you can't. There is no consciousness unless it's conscious, not conscious of something. So that's sort of useful in, in a sense. And, and of course, the famous slogan that people attribute to Husserl, back to the things themselves, um, sort of, you, you know, you could say, well, yeah, of course, that's part of what he was trying to do. Um, but of course, Husserl himself admits very quickly that uh, that's not so easy. We can't just go back to the things themselves. Um, we have to work through uh, uh, human consciousness. How do, how do we how do we engage with uh, the, the things? Um, so he kind of abandons that or brackets that, uh, if you like, famously, and says, "Well, um, we 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 don't know. We we can never be sure that what we've experienced is really what's happening out there in the world, and we will we never will know that." Um, what we can interrogate, if you like, is the contents of, of consciousness or the objects of consciousness. So it is, in a way, back to things, uh, but it's back to things as they appear to us. So that's a very important distinction that Husserl is, is sort of having to admit. Um, but anyway, the idea of intentionality, the notion that consciousness is always consciousness of something, that's the point where Merleau-Ponty comes in, if you like. So he picks that up and tries to really shake it up and say, okay, what? how can we possibly understand? And then he focuses on perception. That becomes thematic really through through his the rest of his, his career, the rest of his life. Um, so uh, perception is really what, what uh, the way that Merleau-Ponty tries to attack this uh, problem of the consciousness of something. How do we perceive things out there in the world? Uh, but of course, he quite uh, uh, quickly comes to realize that that's... Um, this is this is is problematic to begin with the body, if you like, as or begin with the subject, thinking and then how to connect that to the world. That's that's a problem. Uh, he's sort of starting in the in the wrong place. So um, 
that's where he admits this. So, uh, and it comes quite late. So this is in one of the notes uh, to his final, what was published anyway, it's his final book, The Visible and the Invisible. Um, this sort of admission in a sense, yes, the problems posed in phenomenology of perception are insoluble because I start there from the consciousness object distinction. So you can read back then, I think, you can read this a long way back into his middle period of work. And you can see that, yeah, he he's he knows this already early on. He probably knew this when he was writing Phenomenology of Perception. He was finding this again and again, but he was somewhat in denial about it, I presume. Um, so this is the clearest statement that I've found so far of him really of saying exactly that. But it feels as though, no, he's recognized it earlier, but he hasn't quite said it in in, in so many words. Now, I put this in, I've got a couple of quotes here from uh, Michel Foucault. So again, forgive me, this is a slight uh, uh, interlude, in a sense, between that sort of first section and before we go on and look at the two later phases of uh, Meloponti's work. But I thought this might be an interesting point to feed this in, because I'm trying, I suppose, to head off uh, uh, one of the key criticisms of, of the of phenomenology, or, or, or an accusation, anyway, of a, of a limitation, apparent limitation, in phenomenology, which is that it seems as though it's clinging on to this notion of, of uh, a, a, a traditional, you know, if you like, conventional notion of subjectivity, of human human subjectivity as, as the beginning of, of everything. Um, and I think this is a nice, very nice quote from Foucault, uh, just putting Meloponti, if you like, up against Deleuze, you know, say, well, you know, what's going on? Something, <laughs> something's missing in this earlier uh, stuff. Um, and Deleuze seems to have, seems to be getting us much closer. Now, I don't want to say that, you know, everything we can find in Deleuze is already there in Meloponti in some way. I'm not saying that, of course. But equally, uh, I, I do want to claim that there are some things that are in Deleuze that are there already in, particularly in Meloponti's later work. So I don't I don't see these things as uh, Foucault suggests here as being the most alien, if you like, to to each other. But if you just focus on the early world, particularly on phenomenology of perception, yes, one could say it seems as if, or the logic of sense can be read, okay, can be read as the most alien. So, um, so I think that's that's interesting. Um, but what Meloponti is always, I think, already talking about is um is something which is trying to deal with this idea of, of what's going on at the surface of of bodies and that there is something impenetrable and maybe is something incorporeal about what's going on at the surface of the body um and meloponti i think is already taking us some steps towards trying to understand that um not as a centered organism but very much as a decentered organism and as, i guess as i hinted at right back in my title for the talk today uh, something, an idea in Merleau-Ponty that could even be described as a sort of post posthuman or posthumanist notion, if you like, that the body is not, or the subject is not centered in the body. It's it's displaced. It's somewhere between, if you like, the body and the world. Um, in what Merleau-Ponty later comes to call the the flesh or the flesh of the world. So I'm slightly anticipating my kind of conclusions there in a second. Um, but I just wanted to finish this little interlude on uh, uh, drawing on uh, on, uh, on Foucault, um, and you can see in a in a sense there's a kind of obvious logic here, which is that Foucault is the next generation and obviously wanting to, if you like, to separate himself and his generation from everything that's gone before, and so they tend, to, as many as this next generation of French thinkers tend to do, to just bracket together, uh, particularly to keep Sartre and Merleau-Ponty bracketed together, which I think is hugely problematic because Sartre's work goes off way back, if you like, turns about face and heads back to the subject, the centred subject. And uh, as as other people have said, you know, Sartre's work will probably not really survive as philosophy. You know, his his reputation as a philosopher probably won't survive that long. But he may he may survive much longer as a novelist, you know, for for a, or a, and a playwright, whatever. For example, so I definitely need to separate Sartre uh, from uh, Melo Ponty. Um, and uh, anyway, there are there are uh, yeah other issues there that we might. Uh, um, but I think this this point here that Foucault does pick up on, I think, is really, really important. So this finally here, in a way, somewhat um, uh, kind of uh, clarifies or at least re re uh, 
uh, uh, sort of brings us, bring, allows us again, if you like, to engage with with Melo Ponti. That Foucault gives him some some real credit here for drawing phenomenology and, and structuralism uh, together around the problem of language. So the turn, you could say, this is another echo of Heidegger in a sense. There is a clear turn towards language in the middle period of Melo Ponti's career, and and it comes partly through engagement with uh, yeah those people we'd think of as arch structuralist uh, thinkers, uh, Saussure, of course, originally, and then um, uh, and then uh, Levi Strauss. So yeah, uh, Foucault at least gives moves Melo Ponti some credit for 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 doing for uh, for, the, for this shift um, into the realm of uh, of language, and this is Melo Ponti himself in a way saying yes, that's what I meant, as if talking to us from from the grave uh or talking to Foucault <laughs> from the grave to say um yes exactly that's that's true that if you want to label me a humanist um then okay but just be careful because what I'm doing is not the kind of humanism what he calls here shameless humanism of our uh, uh elders so humanity fully guaranteed by natural law um and, and so on and so on so um, I'll leave that there. Again, uh, it's, it'll be there on the slides on the recording if you wanted to go back to any of that. It's a bit of, I know bringing in Foucault is always uh, somewhat dangerous in, a, in any 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 uh, context. Uh, but I, I do it just to, again to try, as I said, to sort of head off one of, one of the criticisms of uh, Melo Ponti's work. But I think this middle period is absolutely key and is not really given much attention. Um, again, partly because some of the work that he was intending to publish as sort of finished volumes, you know, finished books. Um, again, never quite happened. It's there's a really you get a real sense that it's a kind of restlessness that he's really digging and searching for something and he really can't he's really not clear what what it is. So it's a little bit like Heidegger's later work that fragments, you know, produces a lot. You know, there's a lot of essays here, but they're not many books or not many major major completed books. So this is one of the more useful ones. It has now been published as a book, you know, as if it had been finished by Merleau-Ponty, but it, it never was. It's it called the, the Prose of the World. It's published as, in English, The Prose of the World. But it was something, a project that he really just shelved. You know, he'd kind of 90% finished this thing, but then some dissatisfied, whatever, or distracted by the next project. Um, it doesn't see the light of day uh, properly at, at the time. Um, but the collection signs again. This is English translation uh, published in English in 19, uh, 1960. Um, what's interesting here is uh, again you see it, it's a collection of essays of short shorter pieces. Uh, but there's a key essay in there which is called the Phenomenology of Language. So if you want to go and uh, again to, to looking for another way in to go and read some sort of original, if you like, uh, Melo Ponti, I can't recommend that one highly enough. The phenomenon, uh, phenomenology of language. It's partly because it's um, it's novel in a sense in relation to his earlier work. It feels as though now he's really opening a new chapter. But then there's also something curious in it, which is that you start to see examples that you can actually go and find in the later chapters of the phenomenology of perception. So it's curious, they hadn't actually kind of properly been formulated then, but he was already anticipating some of this later shift in his thought around the importance of language uh, per se, um, that we can now sort of identify as a middle period kind of turning point where he seems to flip over his, uh, his starting position. Uh, but it was curiously, already being hinted at in, in the later chapters of, uh, of the earlier book. So I call this a linguistic subject partly as a way of saying, well, what's going on now is uh, Meloponti's kind of looking now through the other end of the telescope. So with the body subject, we still have this sense of being somewhat trapped inside with the individual agent, you know, trying to find ways to reach out in, into the world and to make sense of it. In this phase, what we're getting really is a looking from the outside in. So he's really now talking about the way in which subjectivities are structured by some kind of collective social phenomenon, basically. Language becomes his sort of arch example. So language is kind of paradigm case of this, but he's interested, as Levi-Strauss and others were in all the other manifest as Foucault, also all the other manifestations of, if you like, collective effort that produce a set of structures in which then each of us who's sort of born into the world, literally, and you know, kind of thrown into a world, um, we have to use, you know, we have to take up those structures, even if we don't like them, or we feel 
constrained or limited, whatever, straitjacketed by the, the, you know, the language that's offered up to us uh, to use. But we know equally that if we depart uh, too far from them, um, we, we we just we nothing works. You know, if we speak a new language, nobody will understand us. So we have to accept the limitations of this these various systems that are kind of handed down to us. And uh, much as, again, later generation of thinkers like um, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, for example, you know, talk, talk exactly again about these processes, the so-called habitus of a particular situation that we have to try to come to terms with, you know, as if, as if we're imagine, you know, close your eyes, open your eyes and you're in the middle of somebody else's basketball match whatever. And you've never seen basketball before. You've no idea what these people are doing, their strange vests um running around agitate and throwing this round thing from one to another and somebody in a minute somebody's going to throw you the ball um what on earth do you do with it uh, that's not a bad analogy for for this sense of of kind of a world already underway and and poss- probably at some speed that we've got to try very quickly and find a way of dealing with you know find a way to cope with so all of that, in a sense, is about top-down structures that, that then, if you like, subjectivity has yeah, to kind of form itself out of, in a sense. You know, if we are going to be able to stand back and think about, begin to think of ourselves as somewhat independent or somewhat autonomous individuals, uh, we're going to have to do it by a gradual process, if you like, of somewhat sort of drawing ourselves outside of that, or at least momentarily stepping outside, reflecting on where we are, how we fit into these structures, how we operate, and so on. So Meloponti's great example of that is uh, language. So that's uh, that's a way of saying, this is from a, a review. I came across a couple of quotes here, which I thought were really, really useful. Um, from an, a review of a new book, a recent book on uh, uh, Meloponti, which I would recommend anyway. It's a really good introduction. Well, it's two things, really. It's an introduction to Meloponti uh, for philosophers mainly, but it's very accessible. Um, and it's also somewhat of a development or an extension of uh, Meloponti's work. Um, but the reviewer here, I think, picks up a really interesting point about this middle period of Meloponti's work, talking about linguistic meaning emerging from the structural relationships between various components. So it's really Meloponti's yeah, creative interpretation of, uh, of uh, Saussure's work. Um, This is another quote from the same uh, source. Again, this idea, I've kind of said this already, I suppose, the notion of the the body as as the meaning-making agent, if you like, and the difficulty of that, um, and the shift then towards this idea of a kind of a collective source of meaning-making out of which individuals can kind of draw, uh, to some extent, individualized uh, statements in language or in uh, uh, experiences. Now, the thing that I, I, I suggested, um, uh, I think, a few minutes ago about um, how how we do this, if you like, through language or, um, yeah, the best way, I suppose, to understand what's going on in language is, is to make the analogy with drawing in architecture in a sense that we can use language like we use drawing in a design process in order to, to discover some as a kind of tool of discovery, I suppose, that we think through drawing as designers. And what Meloponti is suggesting is that just in a very similar way, we think through speaking, and we don't always know for sure what what's going to come out. You know, we begin speaking, and we can't do anything else. We just have to do that. We have to begin to articulate, and literally, in in a sense, as we hear ourselves speaking, uh, we begin to realize what it is we're saying, or what what it is that we were, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to say in the midst of the moment. So again, there's another circular process going on there, which I think is really really fascinating and as Meloponti is suggesting here if you if you if you if you try to freeze it you know try to stop that process because you want to inspect what's going on you know at each step in the process um you're lost again you've lost the essence of what's actually happening because it's a dynamic unfolding process so as he says here if you think oh let's have a look at a bit of this sort of uh, linguistic material and as he says yeah you might grab it and think you've got it but actually yeah it's nothing a bit of verbal material in uh, uh, in in our uh, in our fingers now one of the interesting things and i use this in my uh, chapter i forget which chapter it'll come up again on the slide in a second um but i talk about this idea uh, in relation to creativity uh, in design again so i use meloponti's understanding of language as a creative 
process, if you like, as a creative tool by which we sort of realize what it is we were trying to say, or we realize what we're thinking by verbalizing. Um, he also talks about the way in which language is also gradually changing. You know, it's not fixed. So even though we inherit these, these structures from society, we have to take up the, the linguistic tools that we're offered. It doesn't mean that we're stuck with them forever. They're not fixed. Language also gradually evolves and changes, and it does so often quite quickly. But it, again, it does it sort of in the process, so in the action of saying so. So even in repeating words which are very familiar, there is the possibility of, of change, or there is a possibility of what he calls a process of coherent deformation, that this might be the, so one of the keys, one of the key elements of the process of change, if you like, of development in language or in linguistic form, that, okay, yes, we have to start with the things that are there already, the signs and the symbols and the sounds and so on that are there already invented for us. But there is, and sometimes accidentally so, there is a process whereby just in the repetition and the kind of mistakes, if you like, sometimes uh, you, you could call them sort of uh, mistakes, whether they're literally mispronunciations of things, um, new words can emerge, you know, things that were sort of unexpected. Again, just through verbalizing, you know, some sense of uh, like, ah, there's a new term of expression. I'd never heard that. It sounds a bit like something I have heard before, but actually now it seems to sum up something that I don't think anybody said before. And that's a really important moment in, in, in that process of language, the relation between language and thought. So a, a good example of that, a good illustration of that would be to think about the way poets use language often, of course, in a very difficult or very complex way. You know, many poetic writings, um, of course, are, are very difficult to understand at first glance. There's a sense that we have to know or learn the language again, learn what this, how this poet is really using language. Um, but I think what's what, what's um, what's important there is just that sense of the the poet trying to um, develop a, a language that perhaps is is then able to articulate uh, things that have never been said before. You know, to to sort of find a language, find find expression for things that people might have felt, and and often it is again something you encounter on a sort of bodily level. You just read the words, you think, oh, I don't really know what this is saying. There's not a lot of factual information here. But let's read on anyway. And by the time we get to the bottom of the page, yeah, we might have just begun to get something. But it often is kind of literally a sort of gut reaction. You know, it is a kind of emotional or a, a vague, some vague sense that, yeah, there's something meaningful there. You know, there's something significant that seems to be speaking to me. I sort of feel like I've felt something like that, but I've never known quite how to say it before. So I think that's that's an important element, which again leads or feeds into the way we might think about the tools that we use in in design. So on to the final phase. If I've still got time, I realise I've, I've probably dragged my feet a little bit on the early parts, but um, uh, and I can't hear you saying no stop. But uh, if I'm uh, please, uh, if please, I'm allowed, my on. final section is um, perhaps in some ways a more difficult one, but I think we can probably go. Well, I won't try and again go through. I've got a series of quotations here from Melo Ponti's writing, partly just to give a flavour of the language that he's beginning to use in his in his very final uh, final works. But I just wanted to give a sense of completing the circle, sort of, um, in terms of the way that Melo Ponti, having gone, if you like, from one end of the telescope to the other, to mix a metaphor, body subject, body reaching out, and then language or the societal structures reaching in. You kind of come at it from the other end. Um, of course, he's fully aware that, well, okay, but where we really need to be is somewhere in the middle between those two things. So it coalesces back into this sort of um, realm of where we should begin, really, which is in um, what I called uh, embodiment, if you like, or he called perception in, in the early work. And in the later work, he coins a new term, the so-called flesh or the flesh of the world. Um, and you can probably already get a sense of, yeah, you can see where this is going. You know, the language is becoming more poetic, more metaphorical. He really is beginning to struggle with a clear articulation of, of what he's really trying to say. And, and there's a limit to what we, I think, as, as interpreters um, can say about it. You know, I think there's... Um, Anyway, but I'll, I'll offer offer some examples of uh, this anyway, just to, to get a flavor if you haven't read any of this later later work. Um, this is published, this is not technically part of the visible and the invisible, but it could be in a way. And it is actually, what's interesting about it, this essay, I and Mind, 
is, I'm pretty certain this is the last piece of published work that he saw published uh, while he was still alive. So this is the last sort of polished and finished piece of writing. So in some sense, we'd be right to take this as his final work in a way. Uh, it is published as a book in French. It's available as a, as a small, it's not, it's a long essay really rather than a book, but it it is published, was published as a, as a standalone text. Um, and yeah, it is in a sense a, a finished piece, but you can see in it the exactly these uh, sort of themes that he's goes going on then to develop, but not to finish in uh, in the visible and the invisible. But trying to grapple with the mystery of this this sort of the realm of being, this this sort of um, yeah, this this strange kind of merged notion of uh, the the flesh as a, a merging of body, what we would th we can think of as body and world. Um, but he doesn't want to make he, he doesn't want to begin with any sort of distinction between what belongs to the body, say a human body, uh, and what belongs to the world. So it's all about what what's what's happening in this realm where there is. Uh, perception and there is perceptibility I think you know there is materiality really that's that that's the beginning of, co of corporeality uh it's the, there's some physicality there but it's a living physicality um so we're getting into some kind of almost biological sort of definitions as to you know where uh, sort of to try and understand from where has human subjectivity been able to evolve if you like sort of we know that human beings obviously have evolved from much simpler uh, forms of life and we can go back to the simplest whatever bacteria or slime mold or whatever you know basic forms of, of living organisms which uh have the same no, don't have any brains yet you know but have some ability you know to some to 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 exist as entities identifiable entities um, they may not have very fixed boundaries and may have very loose, very fluid boundaries, but they're identifiable, at least in some minimal level. And they're able to respond to something, even if it's a very simple thing, bacteria, maybe it's the presence of sugar in, in an environment or whatever, um, to make the simplest response to move towards or to move away. Um, but to, 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 to at least have the ele element, uh, sort of rudimentary sort of elements of, of, of metabolism in some way to, to be able to feed themselves and of course to, to reproduce. So that's, that's the level on which I would like to, to, to kind of take Meloponti's notion of the, of the flesh, which is where I think it of course plays into that evil, that longer evolutionary, uh, timeframe, that evolutionary development just as it does uh the ontogenetic process by which an individual you know from birth onwards again it seems as if as best we can understand the development of an individual human subject um that babies are not born with a sense of themselves as distinct freestanding you know autonomous entities that's an achievement and it takes several years and it may be that it's only with the beginnings of memory, long-term memory, where uh, most of us probably don't remember much before the age of about four, three or four. Um, and it's and it most likely because we didn't have a, a sense, we didn't yet have a sense of subject, uh, our own identity as individual subjects. Um, and memory is a key part of that, if you like, until you've got um, memory of previous events and some ability to think of your current actions in relation to an action you might've taken previously then um, yeah, perhaps that's one of the key elements of, um, of what we call you know, individual uh, subjectivity. Okay, I said I would uh, mention a couple of references uh, beyond just mine, beyond the uh, Meloponti for, for architects. Uh, the book on the left I've mentioned already, um, so the most recent of these, these three, um, Resistance of the Sensible World. So I'd definitely recommend that one as a, if you just wanted a, a starting point for an introduction. Um, I put the others in. Part, the middle one is ju just as a sort of aside, I suppose, a footnote to this um, uh, a reminder again about the fact that it's not just me. I, I, I didn't sort of invent this connection between phenomenology and structuralism. Uh, others have, uh, have, have, have looked at this before me. So um, that's just one example, a book by James Schmidt. Um, the book on the right is much more recent. I just think this is interesting in relation to um, both uh, politics, Meloponti and politics, but almost this idea of a sort of anti-humanism that Meloponti, you know, that that element in Meloponti's philosophy being drawn into a, a debate about human, anti-human, post-human. Um, you know, so we're, yeah, again, it's not just me. You know, there are other uh, res thinkers I, I respect absolutely. Um that are uh, that that have been uh, been been uh, talking about this. 
Um, so I think I'm probably getting towards the end. This is another, I maybe got a couple of quotes just to finish off. I'm not, again, going to try and explain this. It's more, again, just to give a little bit of a flavor about the, the language uh, and the complexity or the difficulty of the, the ideas that, um, that Merleau-Ponty is trying to describe here. Um, one of the key things is this idea of vision and visibility. And again, touch and touchability. You know, the, the, my sense of, of having an experience of something out there in the world is based on this notion that I, I am a physical thing. You know, what I am as a human being is uh, begins with with some physicality. And I, 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 it's, it's that that always grounds my perception of things in, in the world, even if those perceptions seem to be at a distance, like vision, for example. We often think in the Cartesian sense, that we're, there's no physical contact with vision, you know, that what comes to us visually comes from a long distance away. And it's a set of pictures which we then look at in the brain, you know, the so-called homunculus theory. There's a little person inside the brain looking at a screen with the images that are projected on the on the retina. Uh, of course, that's not a very good way to think about vision. And, and we should think more about it as a form of touch, if you like, as a variety of touch. And, and we know now from the evolutionary studies, uh, the way the eyes eyes have evolved, for example, as uh, sensitive areas of skin, and that in certain sea creatures, there are slightly more sensitive patches of skin that can respond to the light. And those have gradually evolved into the fully formed eyeballs that give us this illusion that uh, we're, 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 we're sort of doing something which has no physical, involves no physical connection, when actually it does, you know, light is physically striking the back of the, the retina, and even more so with hearing, you know, the vibrations in the air, which we pick up through our um, uh, auditory uh, system. So all of that, anyway, you can see, as he's suggesting here, my body looked at and looking, my body touched and touching, and one hand touching the other is, again, another one of Meloponti's favorite kind of paradigmatic examples to illustrate this strange crossing over between perception and perceptibility. Uh, one hand literally touching the back of the other, uh, and then our problem of, of, if you like, or the intellectual problem, if you like, of trying to understand what's going on there, just simply is that as two separate things, you know, we 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 can't actually do that. But in attempting to do it, we're sort of illustrating one aspect of this idea of the emergence of a, a subject that seems to be somewhat at a distance from the object that it's uh, experiencing. Uh, sorry, I've anticipated this quote. So this is a, this is a quote I'm meant to be uh, showing on the screen when I uh, use that example. But uh, yeah, as he says, we're not feeling two objects: the hand and the and the other hand, the second uh, the hand that's being touched. Uh, we have we're we're caught in a strange, ambiguous organization where the two hands can alternate between uh, touching and touched. The body catching itself from the outside. Uh, and, a, and 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 being you know inspiring a sort of reflection, so you can see the difficulties having in finding a, a language to, uh, to to describe this. Uh, but ultimately, uh, last uh, a couple of quotes I think I've got now from my book, which is just a I suppose just my own reflection on uh, what I think Meloponti really helps us to. Um, to realize, if you like, what one of his key achievements, I suppose, was to was to sort of dissolve this problem of the division between uh, mind and body and between body and world, kind of uh, dissolve that problem in a way, or to say it's a it's a, actually a philosophically sort of constructed problem or even a pseudo problem, uh, and therefore shouldn't really concern us. You know, we shouldn't really worry too much about that, uh, that problem that Descartes was wrestling with. Um, and I think it's somewhat analogous to um, to what we get uh, in terms of a broader view of the world, uh, the way the world works from this kind of technical sense uh, in the way that uh, Bruno Latour uh, sets up uh, actor network theory again as a sort of where we have to begin in this in the middle, you know, with this strange notion now, not the flesh, but um, the network, you know, this idea of, of these strange hybrids of nature and culture. Uh, that are always always impossible to to separate human and non-human actors. You know we can't make hard or, or permanent or uh, categorical distinctions uh, between these uh, between these these categories. So what I suggest, what I'd like to suggest as my kind of concluding line, I suppose, is that uh, I think Meloponti's concept of the flesh suggests a radical decentering of the human subject from from a shifting away from this traditionally dominant position at the center. Uh, if you like, in the history of Western philosophy. So it begins very simply, the blind person using a stick, 
somewhat everyday, somewhat mundane example. But immediately, once you've begun to kind of question the boundary of the body, I think that's that lesson from that example I wanted to, to draw out. You, you, once you've begun that process of blurring the boundary, realizing how problematic it is to say categorically where the body ends and the world begins, then you, you, you've made a good start. I think you made a really important move there to uh, that shifts us away from this idea of the human subject as this kind of centered and, and, and dominant uh, thing. Um, I think that was my, uh, oh, so I probably should have had this. Uh, sorry, the finally, yes, my summary. Um, those are my chapter numbers. So I said I don't quite take them in the same order, but uh, language and, and uh, creativity and those things I cover in chapter five. And this notion of the flesh, I really use this more, mainly to focus on ideas around materiality and tectonic uh, expression in architecture. Um, you may wonder why. Um, this is my last slide, and I just put this into you probably would expect this and maybe neil uh, i'm sure neil's heard me talk about uh, so many of these themes before uh, you might have expected me to start with this in a way because um this tends to be where phenomenology begins and ends uh, at least recently i think the most recent sort of period of of um, influence if there if there, if there is any influence from uh, particularly from Melo Ponti, um, it often comes through at the level of of, um, of tectonic expression, you know, material expression. The notion that here we see again another example of a kind of blurring and crossing of, of the body and the world. But now, of course, the body extended through tools and then the tools interacting with materials and then the traces of that whole kind of narrative of, of, of processes, material and technical processes, um, often at least, or at least available then, if you like, to be to be retained, you know, to be preserved, and then to be to become readable um, in the uh, in in a in a in a finished building in such a way that um, hopefully anyway creatively read these kinds of examples of textured surfaces give us one way at least of reading the presence of the body and and that uh, um, that overlap or that blurring of the, the boundary between the body tool and and material. Uh, which I think throw us back into that that realm of the the flesh of the world that um, that Meloponti was talking about. But of course, it's not all about material. It's not just in the surface and the textures and the materials. Um, I didn't talk about it very much. But if we went right back to the body schema idea and talked about how we read an environment as a, a you know as a in terms of what we can do in it, then we're, we're into a whole other realm, which is much more about um, function, really. It's about form and function. How, how can we inhabit a space or haunt a space, as Miller-Ponty says? Um, and that's the other, I think for me, that's, that's the other major element of um, uh, application of Miller-Ponty's thinking, but it's that's more so the earlier part. So if I went back to that, it would be more so number, number one, I talk about, form and function, if you like, in, in chapters uh, two, two and three. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably where that's a good place to, to finish. I'm sorry it's gone on a little bit longer, but uh, apologies for the technical issues we had at, at the at the beginning. Uh, don't apologize. Um, <laughs> don't apologize at all. That was um, that was really useful. Very, very useful. Um, a really kind of in-depth dive. I don't know if you can hear me now, um, Jonathan. Um. Uh, can you hit? Can you maybe? <laughs> how are we gonna do this? Um, but if you can switch your yeah. sound on, it might. Can you hear? Yeah, I can. I can hear you, but I'm. I'm still getting this strange uh, echo okay. feedback with it. Okay. Um. Well. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll be able to to continue in some way. I just wanted to the well. I see this architectural example like in front of me, and I know it was a misunderstanding or something or a limitation about how architects have been dealing with Merleau-Ponty. I forgot mm -hmm. to mention the very introduction that, of course, Jonathan Hale actually is a designer, very much in the tradition of Andre Radman, who won some prizes. Uh, Jonathan won the silver medal as the top graduate in architecture in his year in the United Kingdom uh, as a graduate from the University of Bath. Um, I should have mentioned that. The other thing I think I, I just want to add, I, I was, uh, uh, as we were talking, I was just checking up on, uh, when I was in Nottingham, we, we, uh, Rachel McCann, uh, who was from the University of Mississippi, um, Mississippi State University, I think at the time, although she's given up her academic post, was doing a PhD on Merleau-Ponty and particularly on the, on, the, on, on the notion of wild being. And I just noticed that she has a book um, Merleau-Ponty space, place and architecture that came out. Fairly, I haven't read it, just come out really, really recently. 
but I think most of the the the, the contributors there is an edited, edited collection with Patricia Locke are actually from the states, so we have two different traditions going on. But it was a a fabulous, I think, um, uh, in depth dive into Merleau Ponty and really teasing things out. Um, I just want to say that we will have um, if you have any questions, I I want to ask one question, only one, and like leave the space for everyone else to to engage. Um, uh, we have a Zoom audience, and those they can put uh, anyone can put a the question in the chat and hopefully you can get you to to present it as well but also if, if you're following on youtube you can also send in uh, a question on the chat in youtube um so jonathan just one <clears throat> maybe i could just kind of kick it off by um <clears throat> well, thank you so much it was really really beautiful and i was struck in particular by something you elaborated in some sense um throughout which is the idea that uh uh, language is a is a tool with which to think, and I hope I I I got that right as a as a your description. I just wanted to to to, to um take that a little further uh, in the sense of um the term tool has been used um, by Deleuze uh, in the context of theory. Theory is exactly like a box of tools, you know, um, and. Uh, I just want to try and tease out the distinction between the notion of just language and the notion of <clears throat> the tool. The tool is a kind of form of, of critical inquiry that you would mm. prize things open or engage in a very, um, taking the initiative to challenge and to question. Because I get some sense, and maybe I'm wrong, and, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that there is a certain... Um, to some extent, a kind of degree of passivity in the way that uh, Merleau-Ponty pre pre presents language. I, the back of my mind, that, that when you mentioned the habit, I was thinking about Pierre Bourdieu, habitus, and, uh, 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 the way things are in some senses, um, and the way that they maybe are being repeated to reinforce the sense of how they are. And I, whenever I'm thinking about, about Bourdieu and his notion of habitus, I can't help but thinking about um, Judith Butler, who takes a very, very different view. And I mean, she is absolutely critical about the way things are because they're being repeated. And she tries to be um, to to use theory to challenge that and to question the way that things are being predicted they, and to say, basically, we can change this. Everything is instantiated through the hegemonic, but by repeating things in a very different way through her notion of um, performativity, which can never be reduced to straight performance, but it's an iterative citational sort of logic that can be a kind of, would challenge that. So for example, the, the notion of, of, um, of gender seen as some kind of um, uh, passive form of um, almost a drag. You know, we do certain things because that's how we've been taught to do them from before. And her view that you know we can change that, and by introducing new ways of operating, we can challenge the hegemony of the given in some senses. So mm -hmm. there's something in Judith Butler's work that is radical and challenging the, the status quo that has somehow been accepted by Bourdieu and so on. And I'm just wondering whether you couldn't apply a similar critique if you adopted a kind of Merleau-Ponty view of kind of language um, as a tool to think that why is he not asking about um, theory uh, as a set of tools? So as, as as a very kind of deliberate and um, I don't know what the right word would be, but um, a, a set of tools that are, that are in no way passive, that need to, to be engaged with and, and acted upon. Is is that a, a misunderstanding of, of, of Merleau-Ponty or am I being... Um, or, or, or what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, it's a it's a nice question. I mean, it's it is a really important uh, issue, and I know, yeah, you you could say um, that in that shift that that I described between the first phase of Meloponti's work and the and the second, where he shifts the linguistic. Um, that he's he may be guilty of of yeah of of shifting too far if you like in that direction. 
to which um, the, where the danger is, of course, you 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 lose any sense of agency, uh, you know, any individual agency because you you've left it, if you like, on the left hand side of the diagram. You know, you've left it with number one, and you've said, okay, let's forget that for the moment. You sort of bracket that. Uh, let's let's uh, let's just talk about this uh, broader social agency, if you like, which seems to just yeah, to force us to uh, to conform in some way. Um, to uh, a series of structures which exist, obviously, uh, the uh, others have created. Um, yeah, there is a danger in that, but I, I don't think, um, I wouldn't accuse Meloponti of, um, of of stopping there, I suppose. So what I was trying to, 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 to uh, uh, to describe was uh, was was in the final phase that it, it, we could read it then as a, as a shift back and acceptance that that would be a problem that if you lose yeah, you if you go too far in that direction, you lose a sense. Then there's a danger in that you lose any sense of agency um, at all. And the the organism uh, absolutely yes is um, you know has some autonomy. You know in the way that uh, later thinkers like uh, Francisco Varela, you know Maturana and Varela talk about autopoiesis. Um, of course, there is there there is something there which is somewhat bounded. You know for us to be able to identify an individual organism. Um, yes, there is some agency there. There is some ability to accumulate experience, you know, to remember things and to learn from situations and learn from mistakes and, and so on um, and do things differently the next time uh, in, in, in a way. Um, and I think uh, even Andy Clark's predictive processing model, you know, shows us some nice ways in which that process happens. There's revision constantly going on there. We're revising those those frameworks that we're pushing out, expectations, if you like, that we're pushing out forwards into the <laughs> into the world. Um, so yes, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to lose that. But um, I think the the work that Meloponti does in that middle period, which I said he somewhat anticipates towards the end of phenomenology of perception, uh, d certainly d tries to retain that. I mean, he talks about language in two modes. His other way of describing this is a, a certain distinction he makes between what he calls uh, spoken speech and speaking speech. So the first one of those is the more passive one, which is where we, yes, we do just stick absolutely to the tried and tested. These are the words, these are the meanings that have been attached to them, whatever else, uh, you know, that's the system as you, and we don't change anything. And, uh, and of course, lots of everyday speech probably falls into that category. Um, speaking speech, of course, is the much more interesting one. The much more creative one, uh, it's really where we're we're sort of playing around with the language uh, on, on some level, but it's it's also the way in which new language can be created, uh, but it's also much more creative for the for the speaker as well. You know that there's much more chance of the speaker actually learning something from the process of attempting to say something that possibly can't even be said. You know, but that thinking out loud. Sometimes we call it thinking out loud. Um, you know that that would be an example of that. So yeah, I would I would say um, there is. A, I mean, it's 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 probably that um, it's dealt with, I suppose, somewhat briefly. I suppose partly because of that problem that in that middle period, there's quite a lot of those sort of unfinished projects that um, that were never. And you feel as though it's tantalizing kind of suggestions about that he was really about to nail something down, and it's just kind of slipped slipped away and all oh, the things were finished but they were they were short pieces you know there's so many shorter essays there rather than a single major text so i guess that's why the phenomenology perception still attracts so much interest you know there are still books you know okay. recent new books being published that just introduce that text they just say here a whole book introduction to the phenomenology perception which okay uh, has some value but uh yeah i think it's just uh it's a pity in a sense, unless you know the, you can do it in a, in a way which is i think more useful whereby you do spend quite a bit of time on some of those later later chapters and you show the way in which they do anticipate to some extent anticipate what he was going to go on to do later but uh yeah i think i think you're right there is a key question there uh, and a point to, to to be vigilant about i suppose in in approaching meloponti to make sure that we we don't lose that because i think that passivity is you know can can be a problem yeah um, so we've got a few questions appearing now in the chat. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Mitra, first of all, if she'd like to ask her question. I hope the, your internet is good enough to um, ask it. Um, Mitra, you... Hello, everyone. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, my name is Mitra Allah Moretti, and uh, I graduated with a PhD in architecture. Uh, and currently a faculty member of uh, Kurdistan University in Iran. Uh, so um, my question is about uh, transhumanism and uh, posthumanism. Uh, as far as I know about uh, transhumanism, uh, see AI or technology as a tools or means for uh, enhancing human intelligence while uh, post-humanism uh, are more um, cautious uh, about AI to rec recognize it uh, and recognize its pot maybe potential to replace to the human. Uh, so um, uh, as far as I know, computer cannot have a unitary sense um, experience of um, causal structure and uh, consciousness. Um, on the other hand, posthumanism does not make a clear distinction between human, animal, and a machine, as far as I know. And um, one more thing is about the examples that I hear or read about uh, posthumanism was uh, very interesting. For example, about the uh, science fictions or uh, something like that. Uh, since uh, machine uh, or um, uh, sorry, since uh, transhumanism uh, seeks to empower the figure of the human um, through the science and technology, so it is very, uh, it's cl clear for us, uh, but could AI become uh, conscious and then position itself as the next uh, step in the human evolution? Uh, the positions of the transhumanism is somehow clear uh, for me, maybe, uh, but... It is, uh, but is there any relationship between AI, human evolution, or maybe race uh, and uh, post-humanism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an so easy much. question for you. <laughs> yeah, it's a difficult one. Yes, it certainly takes us a little bit beyond uh, the uh, the kind of parameters of the immediate parameters of the of the lecture. But um, but I think it's a fair, absolutely fair question to ask, and I'm. I suppose then thinking, um, well, two things really, I could answer it just in terms of my own thinking on some of these issues, but I'm also kind of thinking, well, what are there some resources there in Meloponte that we might draw into this uh, discussion to help, you know, to help us think, think through some of these issues. And so I would like to think so, yes. Um, I think one of the issues around uh, sort of machine consciousness, if we might call it that for, for a moment, would be would would come back to this idea that I, we, I was just talking about in answer to Neil's question, the first question about the sense of a, a kind of boundedness uh, of of an entity, you know, and uh, something that can be labeled as a, a thing that has some persistence in the world, you know, some endurance or durability as a as a thing. Um, so I think to get to have some form of consciousness which is not strictly human but is perhaps machine-based, but I know as you go on to say, not just machine-based. I mean, why not? Of course, a hybrid of human and machine consciousness. Um, but I think the key thing to, is, well, there are a couple of things to think about there. One is if, if we are talking about the self-contained machine consciousness, let's say AI as a thing, separate from any human being, um, we would, uh, to, to, to kind of call that anything like human consciousness, to my mind, I think we we have to, you know, it has to come in some sort of bodily form. I think Andy Clark was talking about this last last week also, that um, you know we have to get closer to something which is a, a again a sort of body it has some kind of embodiment in 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 the world and and then I an ability then to engage with a bodily world of things which has other AIs in it, but they to become visible to each other in a sense. They, of course, they need some bodily substrate, at least, you know, to, to carry them, even if they're just computer signals, computer code or whatever. Um, but how do they encounter each other? You know, like we how do we encounter um, web web based forms or, you know, how do we use media, the digital media? So on? Uh, we, we rely on layers and layers of, of physicality, you know, to mediate those relations. 
But I think the persistence of the form, if you like, and the idea of memory, um, computers have a kind of memory, but but the fact that we can just switch them off, <laughs> um, I think is is interesting because I think that does then, yeah, that does seem to limit the the uh, the, the, the possibility of, of really making a comparison or drawing them into some sort of debate about uh, a tr being trans, somewhat transhuman or being more human-like, let's say. So um, I think there is definitely something there to, that involves, again, human-like processes of accumulation of experience, memory, uh, and, you know, emotional, some kind of emotional reaction is uh, to a situation, of course, is, is based so much on, on memories of previous situations that were like that or not like that, um, previous emotional reactions to things, you know, to, uh, things, to, to things, new experiences evoke unpleasant associations or, or pleasant ones. Memory seems to be absolutely key to, the, to, that, um, to those sort of processes um, and the persistence of memory, therefore. Uh, and this entity that has a kind of character because it has embedded in it that sort of that history, you know, as, as all of us as human agents, if you like, or as human subjects, we want to keep using that difficult not to use that terminology. Um, but what makes us individual, of course, is the fact that we all occupy a unique perspective on the world. No two people can possibly have had the same experience of anything. Two, two people can't physically occupy the same space at the same time. Um, and that gives us all a certain uniqueness, even if we think of ourselves as being pretty ordinary, similar people to the people who live next door and down the road or whatever. So, yeah, I think there's some really interesting uh, issues there around AI as standalone phenomena. Um, but then the, the notion of the, this transhuman, which gets us back into that realm that, uh, that uh, Bruno Latour Described so well, I think, of um, human or nature culture, human, uh, human and non-human actors, um, I think is in a way a much more interesting area to be in. But um, but yeah, I don't have a lot more to. Uh, Neil can probably answer this uh, much better than uh, than I can. <laughs> I, I, I'm, let me just maybe add a little bit because I was just writing about this in the last few days, and it is, <clears throat> I mean, a can of worms. It, it's extremely difficult territory. I mean. I mean, first of all, you could take the position as people like Enel Seth, um, Demis Osibis, and a number of other people have taken this. Basically, there's, you don't necessarily have to connect uh, intelligence with consciousness. Um, they could exist separately. And greater intelligence doesn't necessarily lead to consciousness. Um, but then there's, there are any, any number of, of views on this. And consciousness is one of the most difficult, difficult territories out there, for sure. And people like David Chalmers thinks that eventually AI could get towards consciousness and so on. And there's certainly some discussions about AGI because of the success of the whole um, uh, GPT um, um, series that we might be getting close to AGI. I, I'm, I'm kind of persuaded by Daniel Dennett, who's a kind of figure in the background here, who yeah. kind of uh, um, is, a, is a bit of a kind of skeptic in some sense. I mean, he thinks that consciousness itself is an illusion, which I think is a really beautiful thing to float out there as a kind of spanner in the works, certainly. And, and he thinks that maybe conscious, that maybe AI could become conscious, but you know, he thinks that most AI researchers have got a very simplistic notion about consciousness, and it goes much deeper than that. Um, but I, it's, it's a can of worms, that, that particular question. But I did want to just pick up on one particular thing in the question, that is the notion of the post-human, because Andy Clark has got a particular position on this, which is like is quite interesting because uh, against someone like Catherine Hales, who's arguing for the post-human the whole time, mm -hmm. he's basically saying uh, and focusing on, and I don't know how this fits in this today's discussion, on the human and the plasticity of the human brain and saying our adaptation is precisely because of that plas plas uh, plasticity and, and therefore the post-human doesn't really make much sense. So he's he definitely takes a position on that. And I, I refer to that in the introduction to my book on, on AI. Um, uh, it's certainly a debate. And I think that that was a, that was a very good question, Mitra. So, um, but maybe... Yeah, you, on, essentially, you, know, you just reminded me, yeah. I mean, I, it skipped me up by quickly, but my title for the lecture today, and the, or the subtitle for the lecture, was uh, uh, From the Pre-Human to the Post-Human. And, and again, exactly what you just said, basically, my reason for doing that, just putting those two terms together, was to somewhat problematize the post-human as some new thing, you know, some whole wholly new condition that we've never experienced before, you know, some scary future prospect, dystopian future, just to say that actually we've always been post-human. 
uh, mm. that's really what, yeah, that, 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 that would be my kind of take home me- me response to that, that part of the question. Yeah. So we have a, um, <clears throat> a number of questions also. Um, first, I know Vasco, whether you'd be able to <clears throat> ask yours, I know that Mikhail's got a question and also Cletus, and there may be some other ones in the question like in the, the seventh scene. Um, um, Vasco, are you able to ask a question? Is it noisy? Uh, yeah, it's noisy. Can you please uh, uh, read the question, Neil? Hold on a second. So I'm coughing at the same time. Um, Vasco, okay. Some critics argue that Merleau-Ponty's emphasis on embodied experience and perception lacks a coherent theoretical framework for architectural practice. How does your interpretation in Merleau-Ponty for Architects address or reconcile this criticism? Yeah, thank, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Vasco, uh, Vasco. Yeah, um, I, I think it's a fair criticism. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, uh, it's it's certainly not. Um, it, it doesn't just sort of fall out, if you like, out of the mix. You know, it's it's not there in one place that you could point to. It probably isn't even in people like um, uh, in Heidegger. But in Heidegger, there is at least, you know, the, the essay, famous essay, Building Dwelling Thinking. It's got the word building in the title. It might not be the best place to begin for us, for architects, but it's where a lot of architects do begin. And, you know, one can, to an extent, construct quite quickly, if you like, out of that essay, out of the, the well, actually, the other the book in the series, I think, were well, the second volume in the Thinkers for Architects series on Heidegger for Architects basically does that. I mean, it just focuses on those three essays. It doesn't really touch on being in time at all, more or less. It just maybe it shouldn't be called Heidegger for architects. It should be called Heidegger's three essays on architecture for architects. Um, so that's a different sort of prospect. But in Meloponti, it's much harder to find it. So uh, yes, and uh, it took me a long time. And of course, it took everybody because nobody done, you know, nobody really done this before. I mean, one of the few uh, architectural theorists, I guess, to have really, really looked at Merleau-Ponty with, uh, seriously and, and written about it is uh, Johanny Palasma. But if you probably know, I mean, he's got, a, I think, an interesting approach, but it feels quite partial in a way. It's quite. Um, and then practitioners like Stephen Hall, who've engaged, as many practitioners do, you know, in, in, in sort of cherry picking particular ideas from places and, and taking a label and doing something with it. You know, that's great, but it doesn't necessarily explain the philosophy that well. But um, what, Steve, what some, someone like Stephen Hall is doing, I think, is a good illustration of the problem of trying to find a coherent, well-formed architectural theory in Merleau-Ponty, uh, because it's not, I wouldn't say it's because it's not there, but it's not there in one place. Uh, it's spread, I, well, I've, I've tried to suggest today, it's, it's here and there throughout, you know, classic, it's, it's, it's there, but you've got to do a lot of digging to find it. And what I try to do in the book to address that, as you say, to ad- reconcile the, um, the problem is, um, is, yeah, is to try and pull together from various sources under some architectural themes, such as I suggest, like form and function, uh, materiality, tectonic, and so on. So I, I do that. It took me a while to get to work out just the best way. It may not be the best way, but to work out a manageable way of, 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 cons- of structuring the book so that it, it hopefully would be clear to to architects yes. and point you know point them back in different directions to the places in in the original work you know which i think are, are sort of useful to um to to engage with but um yeah you're right it's it's not coherent and fully formed by any means as as an architectural theory but i just think it's so rich in terms of you know it touches on so much but it begins i think in such a key position with perception and the environment you know one of the one of the definitions i came up with as a way to just describe what a what a building is you know imagine a, a designed space in melopontian terms is to think of think of an environment as an arena structured for action that's i didn't tell you everything but it's i think it's not a bad starting point for thinking about a, yeah a, i think a properly phenomenological understanding of architecture as as a place in which we do things you know a place which should offer us opportunities to engage op- opportunities for action and interaction and uh, and meloponti uses a nice term uh, he calls um, he calls them solicitations he says you know that we what we're offered by an environment 
is a, is a series of, of solicitations, if you like, invitations to act, invitations to engage. And our first mode of in, encounter with those offers, if you like, those opportunities, is, is, a, is a bodily one. You know, before we might begin to think about what's going on, uh, we instinctively or intuitively or whatever it is, you know, we, we have some familiarity with any built environment, even if we've never, a building we've never been in before. Uh, most buildings have some relation to buildings we've been in previously. So we've always got some kind of starting point, you know, some sense of, okay, I think I know what to do here. You know, a door handle looks roughly like a door handle and, you know, and and, and so on. So, um, yeah, anyway, I think there are, there are lots of points in Melopondi, but you're right, it's it's fragmented and it's uh, slippery and, and it's a challenge to find it. And I would hope that others with my sort of brief, if you like, my... Uh, uh, the project I set myself in in that book would um, would also would still want to do it and do it in a different way, uh, and that would be equally, if not more, more useful. Great, we've got some more, more questions. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that we've also you have in your audience. Um, Sanford Quinter has been um, commenting on how impressed he is by your presentation. A clear and enjoyable intro to, to students. Um, fantastic. So um, wow. he said. Is he actually an architect? So I told him that you, you'd been the silver medalist at the RIBA. And you obviously are an architect. Um, we have, um, Michal has got a question followed by Cletus. Um, Michal, uh -huh. would you like to ask your question first? Yes, thank you, Neil. And thank you, Jonathan, for this wonderful um, uh, lecture. Really, really enjoyed it. And uh, good to see so many participants here. Um, um, let's see. Uh, so refer to your uh, suggestion, or let's say perspective on Merleau-Ponty, as, as, as you were saying, as a precursor of uh, post-humanism, um, which also for me would be the uh, a critical uh, perspective. And there was a great question by, by Cletus, so I think we can we can get into uh, some discussion and, around that notion. But um, um, and, and so anyway, I was wanted to pick on this this um, the um, uh, this notion that the body haunts the uh, the space, which I found really interesting and uh, intriguing and in that it may also help us in uh, thinking beyond or sort of going against in a way this notion of space as a as a as a container as though it was uh, as though it had any uh, neutrality to it um so i think it, i was i was thinking for for um let's say for physicists such as stephen wolfram uh, wolfram says that space is 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 granular in a way so so it's not a background it is rather the fact that we can uh, move through space and uh, seemingly remain the same is non trivial it's not obvious so um i was thinking if if one would read that through let's say a post humanist lens maybe one could one could um um take the perspective that a different beings so to speak enact space uh, in in, uh, in in different ways Ways. And that would, in a way, I think, um, made me think of the work of Viveros de Castro, for instance, uh, who challenges the notion of uh, uh, of the primacy of time uh, in, in Western thought and looks into space through a perspectivist lens. Um, so I just want to share a couple of, of, of thoughts, but to, uh, in, in a way, as a question, I suppose, if you had any, any um, let's say, takeaways from your perspective on this notion of Merleau-Ponty and post-humanism or as a post-humanist that sort of, uh, that you've drawn for uh, for yourself. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. It was amazing. Great. Yeah, thank you. Re uh, re some really interesting uh, uh, observations. Um, so thank you for that. It's, um, yeah, I think the the point of, uh, in a way, the most interesting element for me in that is uh, is is the what is the, is the most difficult one to deal with as you say between uh, around the notion of, of spatiality and and temporality and uh but what i what i find really interesting in in meloponti or what i find meloponti helps us to do is to understand uh, both of those uh phenomena if you like spatiality temporality as equally emergent uh, if, uh, phenomenon you know they they're not givens again but they 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 arise out of um, the what Meloponti calls the flesh, the flesh of the world. So our own embodiment, if you like, mm. is 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 where we we begin, if you like, as as human uh, uh, entities. Um, and what appears to us then, or what can be abstracted, or can be thought of then as space and time, are just are dimensions of of our embodiment. You know that that's that's I think about as as far as we can. We can go. So it appears as if there is a something we call space 
around us. But um, we begin to sort of uh, c construct that, if you like, through initially through through moving through moving around. You know, I think one of the best ways to illustrate that in an everyday sense is to think about the difference between uh, the view of uh, the world outside through a window. Look at the world, you know, through the as if through a window, uh, compared with actually going outside and walking mm. around. You know, even Descartes famously says this. And he's looking out of the window of his study and he's saying, you know, I can't trust my vision because these things I see walking around on the street that have got overcoats and scarves and hats, whatever. I take those to be people, but they might not be. You know, they might be uh, they might be robots or well, not robots. You know what I mean? They might <laughs> automata in uh, in the 17th century. Um, but the view through the window in, in Merleau-Pontian terms, um, the, the, one of the issues there is, is of course, uh, the effect of flattening or the framing effect of the, of the, the, the view through the window and this lack of, uh, of, of conventional spatiality. You know, there's this sense of uh, what we could be seeing a, a movie projected on the surface of the window. And we've no way to verify whether that's the case or, or not. Um, maybe sound is a better, you know, when we're outside, we can locate things much more effectively in space. But the only way to really, really grasp what it is we're seeing is to move. Movement is the other absolutely key aspect of this. Um, and it's now coming out, of course, in the so-called inactivist uh, view of perception as part of the you know, embodied current wave of thinking and embodied cognition, a so-called 4E model. Uh, extended, you know, embedded and uh, and so on and, and enacted. Uh, finally, enacted should come at the front, I'd say, rather than at the end, as it typically does. Mm. But the key point there, of course, as Alva Noe wonderfully clearly describes, I think, in his first book, Action in, in Perception, is is how vital that that process perception is takes place in time. We have to move around. Our only, our, our only kind of reliable grasp of the, of the, the world of things is um is 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 it comes out of a sense of how things change as we move in relation to them so temporality is it pop, sort of drops out of that in a sense movement takes time you know on a basically you know simple level um so our exploration of space and our grasp of three-dimensional space um can only happen reliably through through movement um, so temporality just sort of comes along with that. And then we can abstract that later into something we can write formulas about and try to pin down and all, all those things. Um, so I think that's, for me, that's really fascinating. And that's there right from the early, you know, the early phase of, of Meloponti's work. Um, uh, but the notions around the, the post-human, I think, um, uh, emerge, yeah, I think do emerge much, much later. And I'm, uh, and of course, you know, there's always a danger in reading back some of our terminology today, you know, back into historic writing when it's, of course, not there, literally. Um, but um, yeah, but I think I think the flesh of the world is a, is this kind of pre-echo, a kind of precursor of what's I think the for me, what's positively kind of intended by the term post-human. Uh, and it's what, uh, you know, Foucault, well, Deleuze, Foucault were. Were were, uh, were were kind of pointing towards in terms of this idea of a decentered, a decentered subject that has no um, you know no no fixed uh, boundary, uh, but uh, has a boundary of some sort. But it's endlessly permeable and you know porous and uh, and permeable. I think that's the, that would be the key for me. But thank you I, for the for the thoughts. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Thank you. I just I just wanted before we move to Plato's Plato's um. Andre Radman has it's written a lot about spoken about about enacting enacting space, and I wonder if Andre mm. wanted to offer a few kind of comments on that. If not, we go straight on to to Cletus. But um, um, I, um, I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, I was, well, I was going to say if Andre's anything like me, you'd probably uh, appreciate being mentioned, but but not maybe not appreciate <laughs> being, being asked being asked for a comment. But, but it's very nice to see you, uh, Andre. Thanks for, for thank tuning you, in. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Wonderful uh, uh, talk. Yeah, yes, I have to. I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, indeed. Uh, but I'm I'm drawn back to this uh, very first. Uh, uh, you you quoted uh, Foucault uh, commenting on, on uh, the logic of sense and uh, making a point that it could not be more different than the uh, than the than the uh, um, Merleau-Ponty's, uh, and I think 
I think we are somewhat forcefully now bringing them closer together. But I think Foucault was making a point that this this is not uh, uh, this is all too human uh, uh, still, mm -hmm. uh, not not post human enough. And and I think uh, one of the uh, uh, interlocutors uh, pointed to this problem. Uh, I, I think Deleuze also refers to the mysticism of the flesh and, and the, that it take, it's taking embodiment uh, uh, all too literally and all too, uh, all the, going all the way down with, with this. But I think with, with this posthumanism, I'm always drawn to uh, Rossi Bredotti's uh, lovely uh, uh, ne ne I mean, neologism where she says uh, in the most succinct way, uh, posthumanism is about uh, uh, Zoe, so not even bio, it's Zoe. It's just even more uh, encompassing uh, uh, the concept, uh, uh, taking into account both the uh, organic and inorganic life. And then she makes a, a hyphen, and she, then she says from zio, Zoe to geo, so it's always geological, and, and hyphen tech, uh, tech, techno, technological. Zoe, geo, techno. And I think this is, uh, it's irreducible. I mean, th that's exactly the, 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 the post-humanist move, that we cannot ever again uh as it were uh fall back on the on the the, the mysticism of the flesh itself because the flesh is all too biological uh, i think for that reason we need to expand it to so as to include zoe mm. geo and, and techno so that would be my but maybe uh, on a more positive mm. uh, so, so this is more of a comment than but but my question would be we we have uh, uh, by the occasion of uh stigler's passing away uh we revisited mm. his legacy, and uh, and published uh, an issue uh, and argued that Simon Don was uh, very much uh, influential, of course, for for him. But I, I'm mentioning this because I want to ask you this question. In 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 this uh, series of uh, lectures, we always try to, and also your book, uh, the very title Merleau Ponty for Architects. Would it be possible? Uh, Following the steps of Gokan Kodalak, uh, who will be the guest, I imagine, I, I from what I understand, next week, and and uh, my colleague Stavros, they did a piece together. They wrote together, and one of the uh, issues was, if Merleau-Ponty, you know, could we turn it around and think in terms of uh, uh, Merleau-Ponty for architects, architects for Merleau-Ponty? In their case, it was like Simon Don for architects. But how, how about thinking about what is it that architecture can contribute to Simon Donian thought? So in the, in, the, in mm. that way, I mean, would it be possible to think what is it that we as architects can contribute to? Merlo Ponty, uh, 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 let's say the fourth stage uh, beyond the, uh, because I'm obviously the, the, the in, in, your, in, in terms of your three division of that, I'm mostly attracted to the third one, but I'm trying to, hmm. to think what would be the fourth, uh, would it be possible for, for us to imagine what contribution architecture, architecture would play in, in, in influencing his philosophy rather than just the other way around? Because I think we do have something to contribute. Yeah, well, that's a great uh, that's a great thought. Uh, yes, I hadn't I hadn't thought of turning it around in that way, but uh, absolutely no no reason uh, not to. But um, yeah, I wonder if the answer to your question might your in a way second question might be some kind of answer to your first question, in a in a sense <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> about how to think this uh, Zoe geo techno uh, phenomenon, which I think is. It's fascinating. Yes, absolutely. Really, really interesting. I think the key thing for me might be, or, or one response to that might be, if you like, as an alternative, yes, the, the implication of the term flesh is, is slightly difficult in a sense. Yes, it does seem too overly biological. Um, but I wonder if, if we went back instead to a term like uh, embodiment, we might have something which might apply actually across those three categories as being, if you like, maybe that's the place to begin, or that's what we might call it more usefully, because I think that that would be the, the kind of condition that underwrites those three things. There's a living form of embodiment in the Zoe. In mm. Geo, there is something that is somewhere between living, non-living, or was once living, but may not be any longer. There's, you know, some interesting slippage there. But around the techno, even in the digital, of course, um, there is nothing without... A body, if you like, or there's nothing without embodiment. So I think, yes, we should get away from the object, a body or the body, but embodiment, I think, and that like perception, perceptibility and so on 
I think that, that you know, as as uh, as processes, if you like, rather than things, I think we're we're getting closer to something which I think would perhaps answer that that uh, first uh, first comment. But yeah, thank you. That was really really it. Interesting. Thank you so much. You're very kind. Thank you. Right. Considering you had to do that based on uh, with about three seconds uh, warning. <laughs> That's sometimes the best way to do it. But um, mm. I think we need to do something on Vareya and embodiment at some point and maybe try and bring Sanford into that or something. So, Cletus, my mm. apologies for um, interrupting the flow. Cletus followed by um, uh, Gustavo, followed by Deep Tea with questions. I hope you can survive all these, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, with you're, pleasure. You're, but you're a victim of your own success. You're provoking <laughs> all these questions. <clears throat> well, Peters. thank you, Neil. And uh, thank you, everyone. Jonathan, I was very much looking forward to this. And it's even, you know, fully exceeded the the number of connections I an, I anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, I'd uh, just like to, even the interruption was great. Uh, Ashik's comment about... Um, uh, Merleau-Ponty for architecture, just full disclosure, <clears throat> wanted to share. For me, Merleau-Ponty was really the, the solvent that uh, led me out of architecture into an interest in, uh, into the phenomenological art of site specificity like uh, someone like Robert Irwin. So I think Merleau-Ponty very much is that interesting kind of problematic thing. Anytime you try to set a boundary, um, because I think in Marilyn Ponty, we find something that really challenges the idea of boundary making. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's to my, to my question and just this notion of the post human, um, you know, I can't help whenever I see the word post, I always, I think to the, the boundary between the modern and the postmodern that to my mind was really a struggle to move from a temporal model of modernism to maybe something that's a spatial modern model that came after it. And so postmodern always seemed to be one last gasp attempt to keep the temporal in the sense of change. Like something's changed, mm -hmm. but we've only got a temporal model, so let's put post on it. Um, and so mm -hmm. my question is, we're experiencing change. Um, we're all here amazingly able to communicate mm -hmm. through this networked uh, you know, computer system. But um, going back to the notion of evolution and such, I wonder if our sense of human, or at least the human that's being pointed back to by the idea of post-human is uh, an idea of some kind of atomized individuality that doesn't seem very human to me. Our, our, our use of language, our use of tools, I think that's what's wonderful about this discussion, our use of language is almost inseparable from us. Our use of tools is almost inseparable from us. And to this question of, uh, of evolution, um, I've long thought that human bodily evolution was diverted the first time someone was able to say, shh, he's coming. Because as soon as two people can do that, um, there's no reason to get to become eight feet tall. Two people who can communicate are a whole new organism. And it mm. seems to me, since the inception of language, we, we like to think of ourselves as organically this physical body, but we are embodied in this network from the moment that we communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the way we are. And so our, our use of tools, our use of language, now we're in this environment. I think it's somewhat telling that... Um, that the internet began as a text-based thing, and in some ways it still is, but we experience the text, we experience the language as images, mm -hmm. and here we are. You know, somehow the language, the tool, and our communication, we are now this thing, and my sense of the world is that everyone on this screen is in my world. Mm -hmm. um, so the post-human, I think, does point to some a sense of change. I think Neil's point almost of a, um, calling on Butler the, the hegemony of the given. Mm -hmm. um, we are all aware, whatever we were given as a sense of world 
has changed. I didn't have the internet when I was forming my sense of the world. So we are aware of a change, but I, does that change our sense mm -hmm. of selves or is our sense of selves always already built up of a network that is language based and now we have new tools, mm -hmm. but the tools were always all part of ourselves. So I, I, yeah. I just bring that out because I, I, I yeah. am very thankful for this mm -hmm. discussion making all of that uh, hmm. come together. So thank you for that. And I'd love to know your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, no, I agree. I think well, you, you, you answered it uh, effectively very nicely in, in concluding, you know, in, in, in the, the words you said just, just towards the end. Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, technology, uh, languages, technology, uh, even people like uh, Tim Ingold, anthropologist, I mentioned earlier, anthropologist, um it has some very nice work i think from the early 1990s on that on the again in within an evolutionary sort of perspective of um tool i think the title of the book is something like tools language and cognition in human evolution i mean it's um that was a, that was a key source for me that was really i found that really useful really useful work to try and pull pull some of these thoughts uh uh, together um but i think you're right i mean uh, that i think i was hinting at this in a previous answer or maybe sometime in the lecture about um just yeah questioning the notion of the post-human as a, as a sort of wholly new condition and uh and wanting to yeah make that connection back to the pre-human to say we you know we've always we've always been technological you know to be human is to be extended if you like in if you want to go back on the old language to be is to all already extended into the world um, but we've evolved, uh, as you say, and 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 the technologies have, in a, in a way, affected the path of human evolution uh, fundamentally. So you, we can't make a separation. Say we were human up to a point, and then we started to invent this stuff called technology, and then then it all started to go wrong. You know, we all started to become something other that's not properly human. Well, being properly human was also being technological right you know from the history to say from the beginning but if we talk go back to embodiment if you like as the beginning of everything um we could just as easily turn those terms around and say well being embodied is is being technology the environment to make stone hand axes or whatever you know in very basic very simple tools so um yes i think i think you're right so uh yeah uh, nice again for some nice uh, nice comments and um uh so thank yeah thank you for the uh for the observation uh jonathan can you handle two more questions yes we have, uh, sure yeah yeah we've got a, a gustavo followed by deep team gustavo oh, okay Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Jonathan. Good morning. Uh, I think uh, I think I'm building. We're I think we're all rolling to some similar questions, but mine mine are specific to uh, where I'm at. Uh, so I'm at the, the University of California, and we have this instrument called the Allosphere. And a lot of uh, a lot of computer scientists working in AR and VR and XR, they actually um, talk about Merleau Ponty. And perceptions mm -hmm. and looking at experimentally how to expand your body but also how to expand your intelligence through information and data mm -hmm. so i guess to let's let's be brief on the question um so i think cletus talked about this but how do you see the the intersection between these embodied technologies of like headsets or intelligence spaces ar vr xr mm -hmm. How does that uh, change this mind-body world uh, framework or schema uh, with the addition of these AI agents that are learning mm -hmm. from our shared population of data? So mm -hmm. for me, it's different than nature. So if you were walking in the world, uh, I, and I'm not aware if there is a theory that the whole world is simultaneously learning at the same time, and it's coming and giving you a certain type of experience. So it's kind of a different understanding of that framework. So how how would you think about the expansion of this uh, body, um, mind, body, world schema in that framework? 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I think you're, there's some really interesting things uh, happening, obviously now and, and uh, technologically, you know, becoming possible. And uh, I think this this notion of connecting into, uh, if you like, data streams which are not, if you like, non apparently non human. You know, there are mach machine intelligence, machine learning, which is becoming much more integrated into, you know, through simple things like uh, apps that run on uh, on smartphones. Um, and are feeding us information. They're notifying us of things that have just happened on the other side of the world. And you're right. There's an, a sense of a much wider, so much more extended kind of perceptual um, existence in a way that you know I can I can extend my sensibilities in a way to to a much wider field of um, of awareness. You know that's now. Um, expanding a sense of what it is to be a, a human being um and some of that sounds a bit scary and slightly alien but i think i would always just want us to, to put it back into the uh, what we were saying before about this sort of in this uh, evolutionary uh, perspective that um that we're uh, that these are differences of, of degree if you like you know we are becoming more you know we, we can do more of so many things in different ways if you like more different ways than we used to um, but it doesn't check for me, it doesn't change anything fundamentally, at, at least not yet. As far as I can see, whatever's on the horizon sort of right now, it feels as though there's nothing happening that's fundamentally, um, sh uh, you know, in, in non-human or inhuman or whatever, or threatening in some way to our, to our, um, to our sense of, of who we are. These, these seem to be expanding possibilities yeah. in ways that I find, yeah, endlessly, uh, fascinating. Well, I guess, Jonathan, I think I think wh why I'm posing the question that way is with a lot of the scientists that we've been a part of, they're talking about different types of intelligence, like through the body, through the extension of the instrument. But then we're having definitions on what is living or non-living for the human. Mm -hmm. So after you die, you're still living chemically. So I'm th I'm looking at these kind of these intersections between how we are expanding. So just the the definition of what a body is and then what a mind is and then how the world is defined in your sense of reality. So for me, um, thinking about mortality, if we are living in that one in those moments afterwards chemically, what would that mean? Because to me, I'm not sure if Merleau Ponty was aware of that. And also the idea of this global intelligence that's constantly learning from, you know, what's going on. The, de the, the definition of human and also technology, I think, is changing because of just the power of what's happening. So I think that's why I was curious, because I'm thinking about it as this information architecture, like our imagination is expanding. So if we have memory of a room... How, how do human beings evolve a memory of all this technology and data in their mind? And I think that's um, what I was thinking about, like the human creativity. Hmm. How could that help us evolve positively instead of what I'm seeing is war and all these other, I don't know, vices? I have no idea. Hmm. But uh, thank you very much today for the wonderful, wonderful lecture. So inspiring. And um Anyway, thank you very much. Right. But I think that was the core question. You know, now science is, has un new definitions or understandings. Mm -hmm. How do you think that could adjust this framework? Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think that's probably a good, a good, a good one to um, uh, maybe just to, to put out there. Yeah, like you say, rather than uh, I can't difficult one to to respond. Yeah, to to respond to in a in a kind of uh, question and answer kind of. Format. I think it's a fascinating topic, and thank you for for, for bring, bringing that up. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe Deep T, you'd like to ask your question. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Um. Hello. Hello. Hi. I'm just. Hi. Uh, oh, I can see you Hi. now. Yeah. Yes. Great. Sorry, it was me. I was just fumbling a bit. Uh, Great. thank you very much for this lecture. I mean, um, for me, it's uh, of course. I mean, coming from last week's le uh, lecture with Andy Clark and yours, that there's oh. that connection. It's sort of opening this idea for me personally about 
how our like Andy Clark about how our mind is extended and here in a way with with your talk on Molo uh, Ponti about the body and its body kind of a bodily perception of the world or the body in the world mm -hmm. and I for me I was I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the relationship of the body and the tools because you started from that point with the with the pros the third arm mm. and um which is i mean a quite striking image right because <laughs> you suddenly mm. like okay what happens if uh, you have tentacles like uh, an octopus or something are you going to get a different kind of intelligence and at the same time i think when we have tools also tools are uh, used differently you know, like a, a chisel in the hand of a carpenter versus a chisel in the hand of somebody who's like using it to sculpt, for example. Mm -hmm. So where does that expression come from? If, you know, like, where is that intent if if consciousness is not in the center of, um, mm -hmm. of perception? Like, you know, because you always imagine that there's some deep intent like a conscious intent and that's why uh, Michelangelo sees a sculpture in a piece of marble mm -hmm. whereas we don't right so where where does that intent come from in the context of uh, tools and the body you know that, that's in in your yeah. opinion yeah well, I think yeah. Thank you for the for the question. I think it's really yeah. That's a nice point, a nice illustration. Uh, the, particularly the the Michelangelo uh, uh, example. Um, yeah, I think one way of just thinking through that particular case in relation to um, uh, Melo Ponti would be to think about uh, what it is to be a sculptor. What is, what does it involve to get to a point where one is a, can call oneself a sculptor, um, the, or any an artist, painter, whatever, but. Uh, a something, you know, somebody who does something, someone that has a particular set of abilities and skills, habits, let's say, but that makes them sound less uh, interesting, whatever. Um, but the, what what comes along, if you like, with the set with those abilities is is a it, yeah is a is a way of seeing, but it's a way of inhabiting the world, um, and and it's it's a it's a way of being that brings a certain world into existence. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think is going on there. And it relates back to, um, well, with, stick with the example of uh, Michelangelo looking at a block of stone. Um, it's it, You can imagine it's that he, what, he didn't always see figures within stone, let's say. When he was four years old, maybe he did quite early. Maybe when he was eight, he started to imagine figures started to just come out of the blocks. But I would imagine it took much longer than that. You know, I would have thought, yeah, a normal, you know, a normal, like, you know, when, as architects, we walk past a, a vacant plot you know on a street corner in a city and uh most of us can't uh, we're think straight away thinking wow i can see it i can see something there in that space you know i can see i'm looking around and thinking picking but starting to pick up clues from the environment and seeing the world in the way that architects tend to do and sometimes they using tools literally like sketchbooks and things to record those thoughts or they're not yet thoughts but they're just things sometimes basic information physical measurements of things you know but being an architect is is i think a good example is very similar to being michelangelo it it, in, it involves sort of having learnt to see the world or or, or being in mm -hmm. a process always ongoing you know being in a process of of seeing the world the way a sculptor sees the world or the way an architect sees the world so i think i think that's really interesting so the tools are part of the physical tools if you like a part of that but equally the the bodily one if you go back to embodiment in the bi more biological sense um yeah the bodily tools are part of that but it's not just tools it's it's the it's the ability to use them you know like Stel stellark learning how to use the the third arm mm -hmm. it's uh it's having those skills those uh, abilities and uh and so on and the the schema the body schemas if you like that go along with being uh, being being an architect, so um, yeah, that's where that's where I think I would uh, I would draw that uh, uh, connection. And as you say, yeah, people use tools differently. Uh, so in a way, a, a slightly different world will appear to them, if you like. As you said, with the example of uh, I think you mentioned an octopus with tentacles, mm -hmm. and in a way, it goes back to um, uh, Gustavo's quest, previous question about 
abilities to, to, to if you like, to engage with the world through through digital technological mm -hmm. connections. Uh, those are metaphorical tentacles, uh, if you like, uh, in in a similar way. I would I would say so that yes, what we're talking about is is a somewhat new form of being. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. this extended kind of form form of being, but. Um, but I would think of it, yeah, it's it's still human being. But of course, yeah, each of us uh, is, is somewhat unique. So that uh, and and therefore we we each exist in a in a somewhat uh, unique world. And and some of that is to do with yeah the way that we use tools uh, often and and often more creatively when we misuse them. You know, we use them kind of mistakenly, use them the wrong way, and and suddenly something pops out that we just couldn't have anticipated. You know, if we were using the tool properly, it would mm -hmm. never have happened. And that's a bit like Meloponti talking about language, you know, what he called those coherent deformations of language. You know, I might make a mistake in saying something and then actually end up, you know, having a new idea, you know, a new a new thought that I, I couldn't have anticipated until I'd actually attempted to to express or to articulate uh, something. So, yeah, I think that's I think there's yeah a lot of really interesting uh, examples there that um, I think, Mel yeah, Meloponti's um sort of framework can can help us with yeah thank but, you uh, yeah thank you for the question <laughs> and yeah. thank you for the response thanks right. uh, so i mean maybe it's a good <clears throat> I, I assume you're in you're in back in france deep tea uh, maybe i'm not wrong uh, but... oh i'm i'm in copenhagen for oh, this okay. week okay. and then i then i go to france next week yeah, a bit uh, nomadic we were returning back to france at the end of the session but anyway never uh, mind no. <laughs> that was, but that was that was that was such a fabulous session. And, you know, I just kind of repeat the kind of feedback I'm getting from Safa Quinto, who's watching online. I mean, you, what an incredible thing to have, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, we've got some great mm. thinkers here in this group as well. I'd uh, like to, the mm. greatest Michael Benedict here and things. And let's, you know, I mean, let's build upon this. Um, uh, before I kind of wind things up, maybe I can ask Mikhail just to mention the three sessions that we've got coming up i haven't got the list to hand but i think michael has um uh yes just about next Neil. week yes yes, yes. A slight change in that the clocks go forward in the states and not the states as the center of the world just that we decided we're going to base it on american timing and i think a european clocks go back a week or two later or something because it's going to cause confusion so yeah i think it's march uh, 30 hmm. 31st when we change time here so yeah something to keep in mind um it'll be 10 est uh neil correct that's the that's yes, the yes. time we'll we, uh, we ordered yeah 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 exactly exactly well yes so um uh next uh, next weekend on march 10th um we have as andre already mentioned uh we have gokhan kodalak which is um who is at uh, uh, pratt uh, parsons and cornell in the new york city area on spinoza so we're very excited for that uh, on the um uh the sunday after on march 17th uh we have um heidi and robert from uh, tu delft colleagues of of uh, andre and actually myself right now um uh, heidi has joined us today so that's going to be a wonderful session on rosie um uh Bredotti. and then our last session on uh, um, march 24th uh, will be uh, vera bulman from uh, uh, tu uh, wien on uh, uh, Michel Serre. And that's um, that's mm -hmm. going to be our six sessions and uh, we're looking forward to halfway through and it's been wonderful so far. Yeah. I, I, when we say last session, I mean, last one before the next set. I mean, this is the last of this series. Yes, yes, yes. We will be keeping going each semester. Um, and uh, Oh, yeah, for sure. I think this is really building up into quite an important archive of, uh, of commentary on these things. And... Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Jonathan for what what was an absolutely fabulous and very generous um, session today. Very intelligent and thoughtful and thought provoking session, but also uh, very generous, very 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 beautifully presented in many ways, and also for dealing with the questions so well. Um, I have to uh, thank also <laughs> for asking the questions uh, mm -hmm. uh, to be part of this community, which is gradually gradually building up. And I think this is really really important um and uh um and, and thank also those who are behind the whole thing in digital futures working behind the scenes um putting this together michael um and and Baveline and and uh, gustavo and so on as a whole group that uh that make this come happen and uh let's build upon this for the future i think you know i always think that small things 
big things have small beginnings and uh, as we lay the foundations of this we've already had some incredible view viewing numbers um on some of our sessions um uh that um donna haraway the one that session that, that uh, we had with the tail delft team um was has been incredibly popular and we're gradually laying things out and i think this is just so important and uh and and thank you really above all for sharing your passion. You know, it's it's so beautiful in a world that's divided in many ways, and where people are kind of uh, based on financial models and things. To actually share your passion for free with others generously across mm -hmm. the world, and we've had many of our audience are are, are literally spread around the the the, the globe today. So um, uh, I I think this is a fabulous 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 moment to mm -hmm. to thank everyone. Um, so, um, uh, Eddie, Andrew, you put right. your, 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 your camera on, so you want to say something? I don't know if you want to or not. Um, I just want to thank once again for, for, for doing this for us. I, I, I just second everything you've, you've said and want to thank Jonathan once again. Thank you. Guys. Well, thank, yeah, thank you all. And especially to Neil for the invitation. It's, uh, I think what you're doing is uh, with this, the whole initiative, I, th I think it's amazing. And, uh, it's uh, and it's incredibly powerful as a medium. It's a brilliant way to use the possibilities of technology, uh, as we were as we were talking today, um, to set something up which just previously I couldn't imagine, couldn't have imagined. Twenty years ago, we you know we just couldn't. Yeah, this this thing just this sort of thing just didn't exist, and and not and still you know not not many people are doing it in in the way that you're you're doing it. So no, I applaud completely the efforts of you, Neil, and and everybody that else that's that's uh, supporting and you know and making it happen. It's a fantastic resource, amazing uh, series of, of of material now, which is available on uh, online, as you say, free and open to to everyone. I use I've used it myself, and I'll 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 carry on using it. So, yeah, by all means, uh, ask me back, and uh, or if you're planning other kinds of events, roundtable I type discussions. Uh, it's yeah, it's a fascinating uh, conversation to be to be part of. Uh, absolutely, but well, there will be nothing without the contributors. I mean, so it's all down to you. So thank mm. you so much. Um, uh, just to mention, just briefly, next Saturday we are planning a session on OpenAI Sora, completely different in some ways, absolutely totally different, um, but maybe not so different. I don't know. Um, so there will, and then on Sunday, of course, we have the uh, the follow up session. So this is this is an ongoing thing. And anyway, I'm talking too much. Thank you, Jonathan. Mm. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I look forward so much to the next final three sessions in the in the series. Uh, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Mm. Thank Amen. you, Jonathan. Thanks, right. everyone. Thank you.